So welcome everybody. Um, this is how to perform a home inspection class, but we're a little early. So we're about uh, nine minutes. Uh, officially, we're going to start in about nine minutes. But while I have you here, um, thanks for coming early. And we'll start again in about nine minutes officially. But I've got my uh, infrared camera hooked up. Um, I don't know if you have one, but um, this is my um, FLIR B cam. Oh, sorry. This is my FLIR C2 camera. I used to have a FLIR B cam SD camera, um, but this is the one I prefer. Um, low resolution, inexpensive, um, can't see everything like the expensive cameras can. Um, I know there's some minimum standards that people recommend, but um, according to the international standards of practice for home inspectors, um, you're not required to use a flashlight. Oops, did I say flashlight? No, I meant infrared camera. So neither one, flashlight or infrared camera, is actually listed. The word flashlight doesn't appear in the standards. Neither does infrared. So don't freak out if you use either, right? A flashlight allows you to see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And yet, you can't be a home inspector without a flashlight, right? Um, so a flashlight allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So under the desk there, I can't really see what the heck is going on. Is that water more? Not, oh, I can see, okay. So similarly, my infrared camera, right? allows me to see things um, underneath the desk that I wouldn't normally be able to see. I don't see anything, right? That's not an x-ray camera. Um, I can't see through walls. What it does is it tells me the temperature of the surface of things. How's that help a home inspector? Well, um, if something is hot, um, that could tell me something. I could interpret that in a, a certain way. If something is cold, I could think of that in a certain way too. Um, oftentimes, groundwater that intrudes into a, a structure is cold. Groundwater is about 55, 60 degrees or so. So that's cool. This will pick it up. This won't tell you anything about temperature, right? It's a really great flashlight, high lumens, but... This, it's kind of like a flashlight. It allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And can you tell me what's on the table, my tool table, right? I have two objects that are different from all the rest, right? Um, there's actually three containers filled with liquid and water, but one is kind of blended into the background. You really can't see it, right? So if you don't know what you're looking for, sometimes um, you'll miss things, right? So what that means is um, what I'm trained to do, I'm infrared certified, that's a free online training and certification program through InterNACHI, infrared certified. And this device I hold in my hand, I can tell that this thing is warm, hot, relative to the other things around it. And this is cool, right? Hot water, cool water. They look the same to my eyes, actually, but um, with this, I can tell that they're completely different, really, right? And there's a third bottle. This is my Windex bottle. Um, and it's, uh, it's filled with water, much more water than the other things, but I wouldn't be able to tell it at all because it kind of just blended in the back. You can become blind um, to water intrusion, a big gallon of water. You wouldn't be able to even see it. If you don't know how to manipulate the environment so that things like substances like water pop out at you, as obvious as a hot cup of water or a cold cup of water, right? So one of the things you can do when you're inspecting with an infrared camera is um, turn on a fan, turn on the HVAC equipment, turn on the heating system, turn on the air conditioning, um, check the exterior or the roof, depending upon what time it is, in the morning or in the evening. Um, and it's so much fun using the infrared camera. One, it's the wow factor, right? You uh, simply just give your client one of these things. And I used to give um, 
my infrared camera to my client just to explain what I'm doing. And then I would, do you know this trick? You know, put your hand down on, you know, a, a, the countertop or the wall or something and then let them look at it, right? And that's the hand signature. That's the heat from your hand. It's kind of cool. So there's my hand there. And when I remove it, and then they go, oh. And then I let them walk around the house using the infrared camera. I let them look at things. They don't know what they're looking at. And then I take it, and I take a look for things, right? Water holds a ton of energy, and it's slow to change its temperature. So if water intrudes into the groundwater, comes into the structure, into the basement, or maybe the rainstorm, it doesn't want to change its temperature very quickly. So what you do is you manipulate the environment, maybe blow some air across it or turn on the HVAC equipment and that cool water will start to reveal itself. It'll almost just, just come right out like magic, right? Water also does a, a crazy thing. It's one of the substances that wants to emit a ton of infrared. It's like perfect for an infrared observer. <laughs> it's one of those substances that just radiates out and says, here I am. You know, a ton of infrared signals coming off of it. So if you know those two things and a, a few other things through your training, you'll be able to use this device and perform a better home inspection. The FLIR C2 camera helps home inspectors do better home inspections, simply. And so don't freak out. It's kind of like a flashlight and um, get trained before you buy one of these things. Um, and you also have to have one of these. It's the companion to every infrared camera. It's a moisture meter because you don't want to just say, oh yeah, that cold spot there, that's water without first checking it, right? So that's some good advice there. So if you're looking for an infrared camera, um, I highly recommend getting one, the FLIR C2. Uh, this is my personal one. Um, FLIR C3 uh, has a Wi-Fi connection, a little sketchy. Um, the other ones are really good too. Um, the more money you spend on infrared cameras, the better uh, images you'll see. The better, the more you'll see, right? The better resolution, the better lens, the better brains in the camera, and the better inspector you'll be. With him. But, you know, this is a pretty good, decent, uh, affordable uh, first camera. It fits right in your pocket, too. It's pretty cool. So um, that's one of the things I wanted to share with you before class starts. And it's, class is going to start in about a minute. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask them. I'll try to get to them. They're going to pop onto my second monitor over here. So I may not see them, but I'm gonna try to look over there and, and um, uh, see the question. So let's see, Joshua says, can you do a one minute synopsis of Brick Kicker? I see a lot of activity on the forum about it. Uh, Brick Kicker had their national convention. Their, Brick, Brick Kicker is a great franchise. Um, I, we know the owners, they're fantastic. They operate like a family, um, and they have great resources. If you want to go into uh, the home inspection business, um, they have it all for you, really, um, as a franchise. You buy into the franchise. Um, uh, they had their national convention here um, in 2017 at the Internet House of Horrors. Uh, I'm standing in our webinar room um, in one of the rooms, office spaces, at Internet headquarters in Boulder, Colorado. In that direction is the House of Horrors, which is an entire house of a thousand defects built under our roof. And they had their national convention here. And while they were here, they got into our video department, which is over there, that's another office. And we produced uh, free customized promo ads for their um, individual franchisees. Um, that's about all I know. Um, Brick Kicker is pretty good. Um, let's see. Eric asks, does that overlay with a normal picture like the cat phone? Uh, I'm, on, I'm familiar with the cat phone, but um, this camera, infrared camera, the FLIR C2, when you take a picture, uh, it snaps the actual image that I can see with my eyes and the infrared image. 
separately to JPEGs, and then you can combine them if you want. Um, I never really did that overlapping stuff. So it's affordable, so it doesn't have a whole lot of those fancy features that maybe other cameras have. Um, John asks, will you be offering a class on the new California pool standards? Um, yes and no. Um, there is a new video, all video, um, pool inspection um, course coming out with uh, videos. Uh, it's video based and we're gonna um, add a lot of the standards. So Florida has a standard for pools, uh, almost a lot of the states have standards. Uh, California is one of them, Florida is one of them, Texas. So in that course, in the online course we're developing in 2018, we'll, in the summertime, we'll have it available for you. Um, is the for sale by owner property eligible for the buyback program? Yes. Um, we'll talk more about the buyback program. Um, who sells the Flare C2 infrared camera? Okay. Let's see if I can do this. I want to do a new slide. So take this and bring this down and it's inspector out, oh, inspector outlet.com. Inspector outlet.com. And there's a left side navigation menu and you go there and you click uh, cameras or tools. All right, so Welcome to class, everyone. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors, world's largest organization of residential home inspectors, a big brotherhood of home inspectors. Thank you for coming to class. It's an honor to teach. Um, if you need to contact me, I'm on the contact page, but um, there's the URL that you really want. It's NACHI TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV, because that's where you get to register for the next free online class. All the classes are online, free, open to everyone, and live, so you can inter, um, discuss and ask questions and interact. Uh, and we record every class, so they're also archived there as well. And today is January 30th, Tuesday, in the evening. We're gonna perform a home inspection on this house. However, we're also, uh, this is your time. And I wrote down a bunch of topics that we could talk about. These are the typical topics that I go over during um, one of these classes. It's not about only performing a home inspection, technically. Um, so we're gonna talk about how to, how to perform a home inspection, but also I'll try to slide some software and how to write reports, business strategies. I was a home inspector for a dozen years. Um, scheduling and time management, hiring inspectors or employees, Branding and marketing, I got a lot of opinions about that stuff. I hope it's valuable to you. Calculating profitable fees, it's very easy. Handling complaints, standards and ethics, real estate agents, reducing your liability, anything you want. It's really up to you. So I'm gonna go through this house, which has 82 defects. Um, 82 defects in this house. I thought it was kind of fun. It's, it looks like a really nice house on the outside. It's painted, it's really good, but it's got some problems. Uh, vacant home. Um, this is a cold climate, although it's it's relatively in the it's right in the middle of summertime. But you'll see some heating systems and some structural stuff from uh, the northeast. Ah, we have a free professional inspectors convention coming up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, April 28th to May 1st, um, and it's free for internet members and spouses. Go to natchi.org/convention and register for you and your spouse. Absolutely free, everyone else pays. Uh, we're gonna have a great time. Um, there's hundreds of people, I think we're approaching a thousand at least now, um, and it's gonna be a really great time. Uh, we have some great uh, in presentations. Uh, most of the presentations are taught by um, certified master inspectors. They're home inspectors. We have a real estate agent, a guy from SEO, um, a real estate agent is presenting about how to market to um, real estate agents um, and uh, a couple special guests. But um, yeah, it's a free uh, convention. And uh, we also have a large stage that holds uh, 1,200, 1,400 people. And we are going to do large hands-on building science demonstrations. So 
It's going to be a lot of fun. Let me turn the light on. Um, so come on by. It's, it's really, I'll see you there. Every home should be inspected every year. Every home should be inspected. Uh, not just homes that are in a real estate transaction. Every home, every year. Why? Because out of the 130 million homes in the United States, 30 million of them have a defective heating, plumbing, or electrical system. 12 million have problems with water leaks. 4 million have experienced more problems within the last year. 7 million have serious damage to the roof. And none of these defects were discovered until there was a home inspection or it was too late and the homeowner found them when it was too late. That's why every home should be inspected every year. A home inspection should be a part of a homeowner's routine home maintenance plan. If you're in the cold climate, maybe in Canada, right? You should get your roof inspected every year to prepare for the heavy winter, the cold winter. If you have a flat roof, like a 112 slope, right? You need to inspect it in a cold climate, in a cold climate, you need to inspect it twice a year, before winter and after winter. Before winter to prepare, after winter to repair. Prepare and repair, right? If you're in the south, in the hot climate, you have to get those roofs inspect, make it, making sure that they haven't <laughs> blown off in a hurricane or um, melted off, right? There's a lot of deterioration help. Uh, a lot of deterioration comes from the sun beating down in a hot climate. Every home should be inspected every year. Consider this. If you recently purchased a 10-year-old home, it's likely that your home has many deficiencies simply because building codes have greatly improved since then. For example, let's say you purchased a brand new home in Baltimore, Maryland in 2013. It's only a few years ago. And it was built to code back then, right? Well, the requirement back then, the code was for ceiling insulation, R38, and for framed wall insulation, R16. Today, the requirements are R49 and R20. That's roughly a 25% deficiency in the amount of insulation, simply because the house was built according to code back then. Existing houses that are at least 15 years old, that were built to code back then, likely have major defects in their systems simply because of when and where they were built. That's why home inspections are so critical. And if you're a homeowner and you're looking to hire a home inspector, here's where you go, inspectorseek.com, to hire an internationally certified home inspector. They're the best of the best. And if you're a home inspector, new or veteran, doesn't matter, and you want to take advantage of everything that InterNACHI offers, that's your URL, nachi.org slash everything. Go there. All right, let's inspect this house. Uh, let me take a look real quick. Uh, no, 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 no. Alejandro, how much do you think we need to start in this business for tools? Uh, you can get into the home inspection business for several hundred dollars. I would join InterNACHI for $49 a month. I would buy a really good flashlight for about 100 bucks, high lumens. I would buy a GFCI tester. Oh, come on. Someone took my GFCI tester. Oh, you know what it looks like. GFCI tester and a voltage tester, a leak tester. Oh, I took him in the house of horrors last night. Okay, so GFCI tester and a voltage tester. And you probably want a belt to hold those tools. Maybe a step ladder, but you're not required to go up on the roof. Maybe some uh, face mask, you know, protect yourself in the attic or the crawl space and you're good, and you're good to go. You need software. Uh, software is gonna cost, but um, I like um, software that has a, a free trial download, free trial period, like a 30 day, 90 day free trial. So you can test it and you can do reports. Um, uh, there's probably some leaders in the industry and you may know them, homegage.com, um, homeinspectorpro.com, and, um, one of my favorites, spectora.com. 
Um, I actually have Spectora on my phone, and we can go over what that looks like. I'll hook up my phone uh, during the class, and I'll show you what it looks like to use Spectora software. It's really cool. Um, but yeah, for a few hundred bucks, uh, you can get into the business. Um, what actually costs the most is your time. So to be a home inspector is very difficult. To be an internationally certified home inspector takes a lot of training. Uh, we get a lot of members joining and we help them through the process of becoming a certified home inspector because it's challenging, especially if you come from a different industry. If you were in the construction business and uh, your, hand, your knuckles hurt, your knees hurt, um, you were a roofer, uh, you were a framer, you have a skill set um, that's perfect for doing home inspections. You just need to, to be trained on a few other things. And all of that training and certification is provided by InterNACHI to members online at no cost. Parcel, Python, Okay, cool. So if the audio is going in and out, I hear, see somebody said the audio is going in and out. Um, it's probably just a temporary thing. If it completely goes out, sometimes that happens. It's technology over here. Um, you can pr probably just refresh your screen or um, go back to that email that I sent you so you can get into the class again and you'll pop right back in. Remember, the class is video recorded, so you're not going to miss a thing. I'll send everybody a link. Uh, Daniel says, don't forget expenses for schooling and each individual state licensing requirements. Correct. There's 26 states that regulate home inspectors. Half the country doesn't regulate, so there's no fees there. Uh, it all depends on where you're from. Second thing is, um, InterNACHI is um, a licensing provider in most states. Um, maybe Arizona comes to mind where we're not uh, for licensing. Texas requires live hands-on training. New York doesn't require doesn't recognize any online uh, training, certification, licensing, or education at all, which is a terrible mistake um, to limit a professional, licensed professional, from attaining continuing education at an affordable rate. So all of this online training stuff that InterNACHI provides, uh, say for, for Florida as an example, Florida requires 120 hours of licensing training we provide that, and it's all online and free to members. And the state exam as well for Florida is online. So um, a lot of things Internet actually provides um, for your training um, costs only the membership fee. Uh, we do have hands-on training opportunities available, um, not required um, to be a certified home inspector through Internet actually online. I'm doing the home inspection. I, let's say this is, I do two a day. I used to do two a day. I used to do three, and then I decided to have family and a life of my, for myself. So I did two a day, and I realized that I could delegate down home inspections to someone who's just as good as me. So I hired out someone to do that third inspection a day. So you have to build up your business so that you can delegate to another inspector work, right? Maybe you do the one inspection and they do the two inspections. I did the two and then we started off in one. I did two inspections, 8 o'clock a.m. and 12 o'clock noon. That's four hours apart. I leave my house at 7, 7.30, and I get to the first job early. Where I come from, if you show up on time, you're late. So you get there early. And while I'm there early, no one else is here. Um, maybe the listing agent is here. The homeowner may be here. I'm going up on the roof. I ring the doorbell, introduce myself. Maybe no one's home. I go up on the roof, right? By the time I get down from the roof, I want my client to show up. I'm trying to time it just right. I don't want my climate, a client on the roof with me. So I go there. I might as well go there early and do it all myself. That's what I do. I show up early and I don't park in the driveway because I want my client to have that driveway have that access. So I park away, bring all my tools, set up my ladder, and I go up on the roof. Are you required to go up on the roof as a home inspector? Are you required to walk upon a roof surface? Let's say it's a flat roof surface that's only 10 feet above the ground. Are you required to go on it? No. Correct, RD. John. Right. Steve. Perfect. 
You're not required to walk upon any roof surface according to the standards of practice, which is the absolute minimum standards by which you have to perform a home inspection, right? So the minimum doesn't require you to walk upon any roof surface, uh, but you can exceed the minimum standards of practice, right? Um, we have excellent legal counsel advice on how to exceed the standards of practice if you're going to. I did that. One of the main points is if you're going to exceed the standards of practice for one client, you ought to exceed them for all of them, right? So if one client expects me to go up on a roof, they all should expect me to go up on a roof, right? Or at least try. So I was known in my market as um, the home inspector who gets up on the roof because I had a huge van, econ online van, big ladder rack, and I carried big ladders. And that was part of my brand. I get up on the roof. I carried a 28 foot, let's see, 32 foot fiberglass, 28 foot fiberglass, 40 foot aluminum, 12 foot aluminum, step ladder, crawl gear. And I went from a um, small step ladder, a larger step ladder and crawl gear. So I was all over the place. I'm getting up in there. I'm getting on top and I'm gonna inspect the roof from the top and I'm gonna take pictures. And I'm gonna put these pictures in my report, which is the best marketing piece that any home inspector can work on. It's not your business card, it's not your flyer. Your website's really important, but this can actually be passed around. This picture tells other people looking for a home inspector why I should be hired, because I get up on the roof. That's my brand. Now, if you don't get up on the roof, right? You're not required to, and we're in the same market, you have a problem, because I think I have a better value proposition than you. If you don't go up on a roof, and I do, and I stick pictures like that in my best marketing piece, you have to figure out then, we're friendly competitors, right? You have to figure out how to beat me in the market. Maybe you do drone. Maybe you use an inspectoscope, right? And use an extender pole, right? And inspect the roof from the safety of the ground, right? So we'll, we'll kind of have that fun battle and that's what the brand is. My brand is what I do, who I am, what services I provide that are different from all the rest. My brand is the answer to the question, why should I hire you instead of this other fella or this other gal, right? So I get up on the roof and I make sure everybody knows it. These pictures are on my website, bigbeninspections.com is my fake, I now teach. Um, home inspector website. And I put that in my best marketing piece, right? Because by the time someone reads my inspection report, I want them to have enough information to decide on hiring me or not, right? So I need my inspection reports to look really good, to express my brand. Now remember, the standards of practice, which is at natchi.org SOP, does not require you to walk upon any roof surface. And if you wanted to not walk upon any roof surface and yet inspect it as well as I do, go to inspectoroutlet.com and consider buying, uh, it's called a spectoscope, which is a 35 foot lightweight, high, um, uh, very strong extendable pole with a Wi-Fi camera or Bluetooth camera connected to your device. And you can inspect, you can zoom in, zoom out, uh, snap images, record video, and inspect the roof or the tallest chimney from the safety of the ground, never leaving the ground. It's an excellent idea. That might beat me in the market. But while I'm up here, I'm gonna take a look around and take a ton of digital pictures, mm, probably 50 at least. 50 pictures of the roof is probably a good idea. I'll probably do 300 to 400 pictures total and maybe some video of the roof. I take a picture of the ridge. I take a picture of every plane. Take a picture of every uh, valley intersection where um, two planes meet. Um, I take a picture of every flashing area where the roof intersects with something else, maybe a wall or a chimney or a skylight or a vent pipe. I also take a picture of every different types of material and all the um, penetrations and all the ventilation, I everything. Take a picture of everything, right? I can't put them all in the inspection report, but I'm gonna take a picture of everything. 
And code, if you're wondering about what code says on installing this type of flat roll roof material, asphalt roll roof material, well, code is fairly silent on how to install different types of roofing materials. There's a few things, like uh, roof coverings must be applied in accordance to the ap applicable provisions of this section of the code and the manufacturer's installation instructions. That's about it. So to know how something is installed well, well, you have to look at the in um, installation manufacturer's uh, recommendations or installation instructions, or take InterNACHI's roof courses, because we kind of incorporate that stuff into our courses. So you know how to properly install a roof. Why would you want to know that? So that when you're on a roof and you're wondering if this is properly installed, well, you've been trained on the manufacturer's techniques and recommendations. Code really isn't the greatest place to go for how to install a roof. There's, there's really good code provisions, but it's kind of silent. The, the roof section is really, uh, roof assembly is kind of silent. Roof covering, um, it, it's really up to you doing further investigation or having a ton of experience. Basically, the code says it has to be fastened down um, the f flat roll roofing material has to be fastened down to, to um, sheathed roofs. And Owens Corning recommends a certain kind of nail that's long enough to go through the plywood deck. And um, even though it looks waterproof, it isn't. You can't install it on roofs uh, lower than 112. Um, let's see. I can unplug that safely. Hold on a second. Let's see if I can get this to work. All these things. You know, all this tech technology stuff. So let me get this and then mm, I want to show you something. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can get it to work. I can't. I can't. Let's see. Mm. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. There it is. Root. Um, yes, 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 there, Boop. this is my phone. Mm. Okay, so this is my phone, this is my, where am I? There I am, this is my iPhone, right? And this is an app that has a line across the middle and it tells you um, the slope. So you can hold it up to the roof slope and say, oh, this is really, this is a very low slope roof. It has to be almost waterproof, right? Oh, this is a five, to six, twelve, four, five. I can get on that roof. That's pretty safe. And you can also snap this picture and stick it in the inspection report as well. That's an excellent app. Um, and then the other app is Spectora. Well, there's the Spectora app for writing an inspection report. We can go over that later. But, okay, um, where were we? A good resource is the manufacturer's um, illustrations. This is Owens Corning Roofing on how to install um, roll roofing materials, um, how to seal it, how to lap it, the top laps, the end laps, and the fastening. Um, and then there's other things, like in cold climates, there's a thing called, uh, it's amazing, water drops out of the sky and it's frozen. It's called snow. I was just in Florida. Oh, in the wintertime. I think it was 70 degrees, 75 degrees. They don't have snow very much in Florida. But in cold climates, in areas where there's a history of ice forming along the eaves, an ice barrier must be installed for asphalt shingles and mineral surfaced roll roofing, like the picture I just showed you. Code says that. And an ice barrier must consist of two layers of uh, uh, underlayment or uh, um, sticky uh, self-adhering polymer, modified polymer. And there's also illustrations like this from the International Residential Code that shows you how far that ice barrier can go. Why am I talking about code? Because code is the basis upon which our knowledge rests, right? It's, it's, uh, it's the foundation upon which we build our knowledge on how a home is built and performs. So code is important. We're not code inspectors. We don't quote code. Some states were not allowed to quote code. Um, we use code to help guide our inspections and formulate our opinions. And thank goodness I'm not a code inspector because I don't agree with some of the code. 
some of the code, like for stair, oh, example, handrails for stairs, I think you need four risers until the code says you need a handrail. Well, that doesn't work for me, right? For me, having an 86 year old grandmother, I need two risers. If there's two risers, I'm gonna call a handrail. I'm gonna call it a defect and I need a handrail installed. That's what I'm gonna recommend. You know why I can recommend that? Because I'm not a code inspector, I'm a home inspector. I'm a generalist, I'm essentially writing my opinion. What's my opinion based on? Code, standards, best practices, anything I want. Internet courses, yep. It is an amazingly fun profession to be in. If you're not a home inspector and you're considering it, it is the best. It is so much fun, right? To help people every day, giving them information that they need to make smart decisions on whether or not to buy the house or how to negotiate the price or how to get things fixed or how to maintain their home or is it safe? Is this wet? Is this dry? Is this energy efficient? It's so much fun. You become the local expert in your neighborhood. Everybody in my neighborhood knows I own an infrared camera. You know why? Because we had floods in Colorado a few years ago and I did my entire street. I walked all day with an infrared camera and a moisture meter and it died on me. I had to go back home, charge it, come back, right? That's what you should do in your neighborhood. If you're a certified home inspector, your neighbors deserve to know that they have an expert living on the street, right? That's marketing. We talked about what brand is, what my brand is, is who I am and how I'm different from all the rest and why you should hire me. And marketing is getting that message out. And a marketing strategy would be walk down your street. When's the last time you talked to your neighbor and told them what you do or what course you just took, right? That's what you should be doing. If you don't talk to your neighbors, I think you're missing out because neighbors talk to other neighbors, to family members, to coworkers, right? So, um, that's a marketing strategy that I highly recommend. And I did that. I've, I've done that. I'm not even, not even a home inspector anymore. Um, lots of questions, but I think I'm gonna go through until the very end of the roof system. And um, that's when we'll take a break for questions. If you're unsure that you know how to inspect a roof or all roofing materials, right? We have an entire library of not just articles, courses. I would, I would guess it's probably hundreds of hours of training online and free to members. And it's at natchiorg slash 3C. Don't ask me why that URL is like that, but it, that's where you go. It's a short abbreviation for a lot of information. We had only three courses a long time ago, and now we have like 30. Go there, natchiorg slash 3C right? There's some basic stuff. There's advanced courses. There's video-based courses. There's a lot of information there. Um, okay, let's get through this home inspection because holy cow, is that one half hour? All right, let me take a cup of coffee. Hold on, everybody. I always recommend my students to have coffee because this class can go on for an hour. It can, la it can last another five minutes if you want. It's really up to you. It can go on for two hours. Oh, I get tired after two hours though. So this picture, I try to put in the report, in every report, no matter what I'm walking on, I put my feet in the report on the roof because I want my clients to know that I walk upon the roof and I want my clients to know also that I get up close and personal with the roofing materials to do my best to try to identify what the heck is going on. It's type, it's estimated age, it's condition, right? I love those pictures. Those are great. So far, so good. Not bad. Roofing material, the asphalt shingle material is good. Yep. Not bad. I'm kind of a happy camper. I'm blowing through these sections of the roof. Not difficult at all. Highly, it's, it's well sealed around the vent pipe installations. However, here's a chimney. I see it, it's masonry, right? What else do you see? The flue is square. Okay, so if you're in a warm climate, 
Don't get bored, right? This is kind of fun to know. What if you move in five years to a northern climate? You got to know this stuff. Square flues tend to be heating systems. Rectangular flues tend to be fireplaces. That's about, that's about it. That's kind of an easy kind of thing. But the condition of this exterior masonry is not very good. It's CMUs, concrete masonry units, probably solid, maybe hollow. Um, and it's parged with um, like a cement parging, a mortar kind of thing going on. But it's just cracking up all over the place. The wash or the, the top cap that diverts rainwater off of the top of the surface, that's cracked as well. Big crack. Defect. I'd say this is the first defect, right? Out of 82? Don't count them. I think I counted more than 82. Flashing. If you ever see this, uh, that's a defect. I'm going to call this out. Defect? What's wrong? It's not leaking. Doesn't matter. It's going to last for about a day, really. It could crack as soon as I leave the roof, right? And then on the next rainstorm, it's going to leak because that's just a Band-Aid. If flashing is installed properly and it's performing well, like it's designed to, it doesn't need any sealant all over it, slapped all over, no roofing sealant, nothing. It doesn't need painted, doesn't need silicone, nothing. If it's masonry, uh, into, if it's um, tucked, cut and tucked into the masonry, there could be a bead of sealant there but it's essentially grooved and fastened into the masonry. There are no open edges, like the flat, uh, step flashing top edge should not be seen. There's a counter flat. There's nothing here. I don't know what's going on here, but this is just a Band-Aid, and it's going to leak. Can't survive. If you needed to explain what a good installation is or maybe the, the components of a certain system, this is, a, from, this is an illustration from our um, gallery natchiorg slash gallery, it, we have thousands of high resolution illustrations of just about every system and component you could find in a home and uh, in, a, in, in a building. I think this is a kick out flashing, obviously. And it shows some clearance from the, from the hard stucco coating. So if you wanted to like add this to your inspection report to Increase the value of your reports, right? Always thinking about increasing the value. When you can increase the value of the product or service that you provide, then you can demand higher prices. Higher prices gives you an opportunity to have a higher profit margin, right? And we'll talk about that too. Um, so go to there um, and download some high resolution pictures and incorporate them in your inspection report. They're free to internet team members, free to use to help you explain better what you're seeing and make your reports um, more valuable to your clients. You're not required to inspect any kind of flue liner or any interior of any pipe, any underground pipe or flue or chimney or anything like that. However, since I'm there, I might as well take a picture. And when I do, I often find something like that. So there's a large separation between the top flue and the other flues, probably the second or third one down large hole, right, in the flue. can have a hole in the masonry flue liner. The roof material of this section I leave for last because it's in worse condition. It's a defect. Unreliable. Assume it will leak on the next rainstorm. I love saying that because I'm, I'm assuming it's going to leak if it's not leaking already. And we should ask the seller if it has leaked in the past. And it probably has. So that's a defect. I mean, that looks like the canyons on Mars. Poor condition. Okay, while I'm up there, I also take videos of the roof. Now, I did this inspection a while back, and back then I used to carry, uh, like Canon, because it's kind of a meteor kind of camera in my hand. So I need some, like something to grab onto. So a digital camera uh, that took pictures in my right pocket, I had a, a nail pouch with two pouches, a, fr a framer's pouch, two pouches in front, digital camera for pictures in the right pocket, um, a video camera, same picture, but adjusted to video in my left pocket. And I snapped, I was like shooting a gun or something. Um, a lot of pictures, click, 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 
and a lot of video, especially on the roof. And if my client didn't show up at the inspection, I would try to take a video of the entire inspection. And then nowadays you can incorporate video into an inspection report that are cloud-based, right? That are synced to the cloud. And so you could um, send a link to your client um, that allows them to get to a report that's web-based. And when your report is web-based and not in a PDF or printed, um, that type of report is, in my opinion, of a better value because you can embed video. And I see, personally, I see video being incorporated a lot more into inspection reports. Um, nowadays, you can uh, get a free transcript of any video in which you're talking. So you could have a written report developed from the video that you took, if you wanted to do that. It's quite easy. There are two different shingles on the roof. The front green shingle appears to be a, a newer shingle and in good shape, young roof. The gray shingles on the back seem to be older, but still in good shape. Yeah, that's me. On the left side, there's a flat. Yep. And then there's the chimney. The chimney stack on the left side. And then there's the flat roof. The roll roofing material on the right side of the house is in poor condition. Okay. So video. Consider video. If you don't have software that does video, hmm, consider it. Because if I was in your market, why would you consider adding video to your inspection service? Because if I was in your market, right, I'd beat you. Because part of my brand is I take a ton of pictures and video and I provide that information to my client in an easy, accessible format. Ooh, if you're not doing video and we were competing, I think I'd beat you. I'd be able to demand higher prices too. And that's the whole point of being in business. Money, <laughs> right? Uh, if you want a good job, oh, if you want to make a good living, get a good job, right? If you want to make a good living, get a good job. If you want to make a great living and make stacks of money and take on all that risk that being in business entails, well, this is a fun, this is a fun, this is a fun opportunity. Home inspection business is really great. And internet she provides everything you need to be a successful home inspector. And the first step is to join internet. She. That's your door to making a lot of money, right? Why do you join Energy? So you have unlimited access to all the resources that we provide. All members have that access. And then when you're ready to become certified in anything, certified home inspector, certified mold inspector, certified radon inspector, certified moisture inspector, certified stucco inspector, certified radon inspector, it just goes on. We have uh, 45 different types of certifications, all online and free for Energy members. When you're ready to become a certified home inspector, that training and certification program is online and free. There's no big investment to get certified. That's your first step. Next is all the other stuff, marketing, branding, tools, things like that. Defect. There's no gutter on this house. You know how many hundreds of gallons of water fall off the edge of a roof during a heavy rainstorm in the north? It, this is Pennsylvania. We call it Pennsylvania. It rains in Pennsylvania, and there's no gutter. Well, look below it. The aluminum flashing was once painted yellow. It's now gray. It's been washed off. Defect, defect. Defect, defect, all right? While I'm coming down off of the roof, off my ladder, I'm looking at other things. Gutters, eaves, right? Uh, soffit fascia, vents. Siding, windows, flashing, flashing, head flashing, right? Step flashing, counter flashing. And so I'm looking at other single roof covering areas. Oh, I call it roof covering because um, you never want to comment on the roof system because the roof system includes everything. Fasteners, underlayment, how the deck sheathing is fastened to the roof structure components. You can't see any of that. You can see some of it. So what you want to comment on is only the things that you observe on the day of the inspection. That's what you should be reporting upon. 
the things that you observe during the day of the inspection. I can see the roof covering material. That's what I'm going to talk about, the roof covering material, not the roof system as a whole. Mm -mm. Roof covering material looked in good shape in this area, right, on the day of the inspection. That's a good question. Are you uh, required to find all the defects in a house? Are you required to find all the... Well, home inspectors hired to find defects, so yeah, maybe a home inspector is required to find all of them. No, you're not required to find all the defects in a house. I think some clients who uh, have buyer's remorse or who have uh, a little problem may want to tell you that you're required to find all the problems in a house, but you're not according to the standards of practice, right? You're not required to find all the problems in the house. You are required to report upon the material defects that you observe. If you observed a defect and you deemed it to be a material defect, which is a major problem, and you observed it, and you deemed it to be a material, you got to put it in the report. That's the basic minimum. Now, if there's a material defect behind this, and I don't observe it on the day of the inspection, that's beyond the scope of my home inspection. There are material defects all around me that are beyond my visual scope of work. Because I'm not required to dismantle anything or tear apart anything or see through walls or anything like that. So there could be a terrible thing behind there. Material defect. If I don't observe it, I'm not required to report upon it. I'm not required to find all the defects in the home. Only those defects that I deem to be material and I can see. I should put that in the report. Just to clarify. Yeah? I know some of you veteran inspectors are like, uh, is this what he's going to talk about? Yeah, it's good to go over some of these things. I'm inspecting the skylight, um, the, the windows as I come down, the roof penetrations as I come down, the lower gutter system that as I come down, it's filled with debris, needs to be cleaned. I'm on the ground now. I look up on the roof from a certain different vantage point, right? And I see nails that are backing out and lifting the three tab shingles. So the tabs are being lifted out. Defect, 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 defect. If it's a defect, you call it a defect. Don't let a real estate agent push you around and say, well, you know, is it leaking right now? Is it falling off? Is it really hurting anybody? Defect. I love that word. And for me, there's a few types of defects and they're defined in our glossary. Um, there's the cosmetic defect, which are like blemishes and flaws, a stain on the carpet or something, not part of the home inspection. No one really cares about it. However, if my client tells me, hey, you know, there's a, there's a burn mark on the carpet, I'll take a picture of it and I'll put it in the report for them. Minor defect is something that a homeowner could fix themselves. Like uh, if I recommend replacing the manual old uh, thermostat with a programmable one, Low voltage, no one's going to get hurt. Comes with instructions off the Home Depot shelf. Homeowner can fix that. Minor defect, replace that thermostat. That's me. That's how I do it. Major defect, that's a major defect. Because a homeowner can't get up on the roof. Most homeowners can't get up on the roof and know what the heck is going on and how to fix that. You need to hire a contractor. A major defect is a problem that a contractor would have to come out and fix, right? And a material defect is something that's going to have an adverse impact on the value of the home or hurt someone, right? Those are the kind of defects that I use in my inspection report. You may want to consider that. I'm on the ground. I'm on the ground and I'm waiting for my client to show up. Ideally, they would show up when I'm on the roof and I could wave to them from above, right? And I come down and I shake their hand, nice big handshake, big smile, right? Don't come out with, hey, I've got defects. No, say hello to everybody. Congratulations for finding your dream home. I'm Ben from Big Ben Inspections. Thank you for hiring me. This is the first time we've met. 
you probably saw me online or got a recommendation. So thank you for hiring me. Well, we talked on the phone or we emailed back and forth. So this is a great home so far. Yeah, I really like it. Yep. Um, here's what how I do it. Um, I'm going to inspect the house, give you the report electronically at the end of the inspection, and um, we'll go over the problems that I find if I find any. And um, you won't miss a thing. So you can come along with me or you can go inside and have fun taking measurements and things like that and look around and make plans on renovating. But um, I'll find you uh, if I need to. And I, I like to show you a few things on the inside, like where everything is and how everything works. That's my pitch. That's basically my pitch, right? And I hand a bunch of business cards out to the agents if they're there and my client, just so they re can remember my name. Sometimes they hire you and they can't remember your name. It's okay, right? If I can tell them about the roof, I'll tell them about the roof. Then we have a couple problems. It's this and that and that major defect. That means you need a contractor to fix it. And uh, I'll put it in the report and you can take a look at it later. I even took a video. That's what I'll say. I'll invite them to walk around with me throughout the entire inspection if they want. Some clients are right behind my shoulder, man. That's okay too. Some clients want to go in and out and see me. Hey, anything going on? Back and forth. That's great. My next move here, uh, remember it started at 8. I got there about 7.30, a quarter to 8. It's about 8.30 now, 8.20. I'm done with the roof. I'm actually done with the inspection report. I'll talk about that real soon. I'm going to do the exterior. And I do the same pattern around the house, counterclockwise. I don't know why I started off counterclockwise, but I always go to the right. And I go around counterclockwise with a client, if they're with me, real quick, about a couple minutes. And then I tell the client to go in the house. I'll see you later. And then I go around, and it takes me about 15 minutes. So now I'm at 8.30, 8.45. You have to, if, you're, if you're a home inspector, you become excellent at time management. Because remember, I've got a 12 o'clock home inspection, and they do not want me to be late. And I'm not going to be late. And I had never had been late. Well, I was late once early in my career, and I actually gave away that inspection report because I was, I was in the wrong city. I didn't even know where I was. Yep. Showed up two hours late, did a great home inspection. At the end of the ins inspection report, we just said, this is free. This is on us. That actually spread, that story spread through real estate offices and they started hiring us. I don't know. Why am I excited about being at this point in my inspection? Because, let's see, can I do that again for you guys? Let's see. Mm, is it still here? No. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Where's your book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spector. Oh, sorry. Wrong. I'm trying to do it on here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see this? Hope you can see this. Oh my gosh, look how many questions I have. You guys are fantastic. Some classes are totally silent. All right. Um, I'll try to get to them. Those are good. Is drone inspection acceptable? Well, FAA, they have a certification exam. You essentially have to become a pilot. Seriously, you have to become a pilot to fly a drone. Um, um, my recommendation is that drones are for fun, right? So we don't have all the systems in place at InterNACHI quite yet for training on drones, although we're trying to get a drone class for the convention. Uh, subscribe to the newsletter that uh, we put updates for the convention in the newsletter. Um, so we're trying to get drone training in there. If you know a good drone trainer, email me. Um, we're trying to hook up with them so that they can give exclusive discounts to training for InterNACHI members all over the country. And we're trying to put some of that online and help you prepare to pass that FAA pilot ex certification exam. Then you can fly that thing. Um, until then, man, you can't fly. Around here, I can't fly because I'm near an airport. Everywhere I go, there's an airport within five miles. That's a restriction. And um, uh, there are gusts of wind. There's a wind gusts of 30, 40, 50 miles an hour within two seconds. So I know that there's some drones that can manage that, but uh, I'm not going to fly my drone into someone else's house. Third, I don't care if you have a 4K camera on your drone. Me touching the shingles, 
uh, I feel like I can beat you um, in the quality of the thing. So here's my um, software that I'm learning. I'm learning this software. It's called Spectora, Spectora software. If you want details, email me or just Google it. Um, and this is a mobile app. And I like it because of the buttons. My fingers, I don't type. I don't do the thumb things like my daughters do. Um, I need good fat buttons for my fingers. Um, so I'm going to open up the residential report. Uh, I'm going to take a photo of the uh, house. So let's just say this is the photo of the house, okay? That's the photo of the house. I use the photo. So that's going to be the photo of the house. It just showed up there. Um, inspection details. Well, um, it's like who was there. So my client was there. My client's agent was there. And I want to take a, a picture of my client, right? Okay, so there's my client, right? Um, and was it occupied? No, it was vacant. Um, and it was a, a colonial house, let's say. It's actually a rancher, so let's go back. Uh, and I want to take a picture of the house. So let's take a picture of the house, right? Beep. That way, all right. Um, and maybe uh, it's clear uh, day. It's um, or maybe it's heavy rain, right? But um, maybe there's maybe there's video. I want to take a picture of the rain. So this is the video of the rainstorm outside, and I want to document how heavy the rainstorm was, and that there's water running off of that roof. Remember, with no gutters. Yeah. So I'm going to use that video. That video is going to be inserted into the report right where I say the weather conditions, right? And those pictures are going to be right where um, I took them in the, in the report. So if I take a picture of my client where it says client, take a picture, boop, their face is going to be in my inspection report. Roof covering. So here's some general stuff like um, how did I inspect a roof? Well, I inspected it from the ground and uh, from a ladder. And I want to take a picture, uh, several pictures, really. There's one. And then another one. And then maybe there's a video of the roof. So there's a video of the roof. This is all going right into the inspection report. Do you understand? Like where I'm inspecting, right? Um, and so I could do this while I'm on the ground or while I'm on the roof. Um, let's say uh, roof coverings. So I inspected it or not inspected it or it's not present or there's a defect. Um, it's asphalt shingles. Um, I can take a video. I love video. Right? Oops, sorry. I'm going to retake that. It's very easy. So this is the inspection of the roof. Uh, there's a hole in the roof. Someone's going to fall through the roof. There's obviously roof leaking, and that needs to be fixed because that's a major defect. Okay? So that's... That's going to be in my inspection report. Do you get it? Mobile devices allow you to fly through um, an inspection report so that um, if I am, uh, why do I use mobile devices? I want to be efficient. I want to reduce my mistakes because you, as you can see, essentially my checklist is in my hand. I can't mess up. It tells me what to inspect, the roof covering, the flashing, the vent pipes, the chimney, the skylights. You know, is it present or not present? Is it a defect or not? And then I take pictures. And then by the time I'm here at the inspection report at 8.30, I've written the roof report. I've written the section of the report covering the roof. I'm done with the roof. Do you understand? I, I've taken my pictures, taken my video. I've inspected the roof. And now I've written it as well. I'm done. I'm not writing the report at night. I'm writing the report as I inspect. And at the end of my inspection, my report is also written. And with a click of a button, I'll send that completed written inspection report with pictures and video to my client. And I'm done. It adds a, uh, it's a quality of life issue as well. It reduces errors because it tells me what I'm supposed to inspect right there. It adds to my efficiency, which is really important when you're thinking about calculating profit. And it adds to my quality of life because I'm not working at night, right? Because when I started home inspections, I wanted to start a family, but I wanted to make a lot of cash. So we had to go mobile. How to calculate a profitable fee depends upon how much hours you're willing to invest 
in the inspection and it's kind of like a fraction, right? You want the amount of money on top, the numerator, and it's divided by the number of hours that you work to make that money. And you want that denominator as close to zero as possible. You don't want to spend a whole lot of time making a lot of money. If you spend a lot of time making a little bit of money, you're reversed in your business. You'll go out of business, you'll run out of money, and you're working like a dog, right? You want to squeeze that time in the denominator fraction to really small and make a lot of money. How do you make, how do you conserve your time with efficiency in your process? So um, one of the ways you can become efficient is to go mobile, right? And Spectora software is an excellent software. I'm having a lot of fun learning it myself. Um, I wonder if we could see. Um, you mind? You mind if I, I show you what Spectora? Let's see if I can pull it up. Oh, I wish I knew how to do this. I see I'm figuring it out myself. So there's my report, 123 Main Street. If I click that, will it show up? There it is. Okay. So there's my report. Remember I took a picture of that as the house? Remember, that was the house picture. There it is. I went from here. Oh, sorry. You can't see me. I'm sorry. I went from there. I went from here, right, to this is my laptop. And I brought over my browser from my laptop over here, okay? Now, this is online on my laptop. This is what you're seeing. It looks like a freaking website. That's beautiful. There's my name. There's my face, there's my logo. I inspected 63 items already. Um, oh, I should have I should have marked a couple defects. Defects comes out in a big red bubble with a number in it. How many defects did you find? You know, and it's a bubble right there. And here's my, there's my client's, <laughs> there's my client's face. Um, there's the house member, heavy rain, and you can play the video. Can you hear that? Water running off of that roof, remember, with no gutters? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you've got the you've got the roof already there. Uh, information. Remember I took a bunch of pictures of the roof? There it is. And there's the video that I took. So this is the inspection of the roof. Uh, there's a hole in the roof. Someone's going to fall through the roof. This is the Possibly report. I don't and know. That. It seems to be fantastic to me. This is the inspection report. It, it looks like a website. It moves, it's dynamic. It has inspection information, digital pictures and video immediately to your client. That's just amazing. Um, I don't know. Uh, I really like this software and I'm learning how to do it. And we're gonna have a, a class on how to inspect the house of horrors using this software because it's so fun and easy. Um, give it a try. Um, I know that they have free trial uh, offers on it. So. But the whole point is, it doesn't matter what software you use. Um, I mean, there's a lot of really good ones out there, right? This is just my own personal one that I'm using. Um, uh, it does those things for you. Makes you efficient, which is the most important thing. Helps reduce mistakes because you carry your checklist with you. And um, that's why I like mo mobile devices. Man, if you are in the same market as me and you're saying that you'll have the inspection report available within 24 hours, <laughs> I gotcha, right? I got your, my brand is better than yours. My service, my value proposition is better than yours. If I have a better value proposition, I can demand higher prices. And if I'm faster than you, I'm more efficient, then my denominator number is lower than you and I'm making, I'm spending less time making that money. Okay, now I'm on the outside of the house. I used to own a house like this. This is concrete masonry units, concrete block, um, mortared together, and then they have a parging of cement on the outside. A couple coats, you paint it, it lasts forever. Maybe you'll get some settlement cracks, maybe not. Um, it's easy to repair. I'm just looking for large displacements. Uh, if I can stick a pencil through, that's a, uh, an opening. 
The asphalt driveway isn't the greatest, right? Some patches, looks like it was too narrow, so they widened it, and it's just a, you know, it doesn't look very good. It's, you know, it's a functional driveway. It's not aesthetically great. They actually, that's the base coat. They didn't even put the top coat on, right? So I take pictures like crazy, obviously. Um, cracked window, defect, weathered door, minor, cosmetic defect. It's really your call. Um, doorbell, minor defect. Those two pipes are uh, kind of fun. Um, this is um, what you see in the Northeast of the United States, mostly. Uh, it's an oil fill pipe and an oil tank vent pipe. Oil fill, I'm touching the oil fill pipe, and that's the vent pipe. So inside the house, I know that I have an oil storage tank. This is crazy, right? Uh, a couple million years of uh, um, rotten plant life and dinosaurs creates oil. We pump it out of the ground and then we pump it into our homes and store it in a big tank. And then we suck it out of the tank, ignite it, burn it, and heat it for fuel. That's what we do in the Northeast. It's pretty crazy. Then as, we as the tanker comes, he grabs a hose, he fills up the tank, he pu pushes oil into the tank and air has to displace out and that's the vent pipe. So that's, that's the fun stuff of knowing something. If you're in, the, if you're in Florida, right? If you're in uh, Puerto Rico right now, uh, yeah, this is kind of like advanced training. Electrical wires cannot be within reach <laughs> of the yard. I mean, I, you can grab that, right? It's probably a lot of fun for like football or volleyball. It's an interesting volleyball game. Um, but really, it's a, it's a material defect that could kill somebody. Right, so that's a defect there. So th right now, I'm having a lot of fun as a home inspector. Got some defects on the roof coming down. I'm writing my report. Got a lot of pictures. Got defects here and there. This is a lot of fun to have a material defect with the overhead service line um, within reach of the yard. And then I'm inspecting right the roof system, and I'm inspecting the exterior system, but I have also components of other systems they're in my way, kind of like. So how do I handle if I'm doing the exterior inspection, I come across something of the electrical system? It's easy when you're on a mobile device because all you do is just jump to from the roof, uh, from the exterior to the electrical system. And now you're documenting and taking pictures and video. And then you can snap out of that system and go back to the exterior. So right now I'm, I have the um, electrical meters. Main meter for the electrical panel, uh, they used to do this, um, a sub meter just for the hot water tank. So I'm expe expecting an electric hot water tank that's on a separate meter kind of uh, designed to save energy. Um, that was the idea. Grounding wire from the electrical panel to a rod, good. Metal steel doors that you can access the basement with so you open up the steel door, you walk down into the basement. That's what those are. Exterior water faucets in a cold climate, I'd recommend it in all climates because the weather's changing. Um, has have to be frost free so that when it does get cold in the wintertime, that water valve that stops water right there doesn't freeze up and burst because water, when it freezes, expands and it will burst a pipe very easily. So that's a defect. Uh, handrail, handrail is needed here. It's needed here because I'm a home inspector and I put it in a report as a defect. It's not required by code. I think code says, I think, so correct me if I'm wrong, four risers, right? Until you need a handrail. You have to have a minimum of four risers, I think it is, on stairs. I think it's exterior stairs, four risers. Somebody can correct me. I could be wrong, but thank goodness I'm not a code inspector, right? My grandmother could not walk up those, those stairs without a handrail, and that is ridiculous. She could fall coming down those stairs, and that is not necessary. So I'm going to recommend a handrail there. What if the real estate agent says, oh, uh, grandfathered, grandfathered, grandfathered. <laughs> I, I kind of laugh at that. 
right? I don't take that seriously. Because I inspect the home regardless of when that home was built. I don't care when this house was built. I don't. I'm just looking for things that are important to my client, right? In my opinion, this is not safe. I don't care if it was built yesterday or 100 years ago. I don't care if it was built to code back then or it's built to code now. If it's a safety hazard, in my opinion, I'm calling it out. That's why it's so much fun to be a home inspector, right? You have so much power. It's really amazing. Um, oh, there it is. Handrails should be provided on at least one side of the continuous run of treads or a flight of four or more risers. Wow. That's what code is. That's ridiculous, right? So, in my opinion. Uh, wood rot. So at every door or every window, I do the same thing. I do counterclockwise, right? So at this door, bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left. And I'm looking for wood rot down here or tread problems or stoop problems or step problems or weather stripping problems. And on the top, it's really just header flashing or settlement. So wood rot. I'm looking for termites too. Anything that eats wood. Anything that damages wood. Anything that damages the wooden structure. And that's water, ants, bugs, call them whatever you want. Mold, anything that damages wood, I'm looking for it. And I'm going to put it in a report. Regardless of whether they ask for a mold inspection or a wood-destroying organism ins inspection report or not. right? I'm sticking it in the report. Um, if I see signs of termites, in some states I'm not, not allowed to identify the bug because I'm not an entomologist, but I'm going to identify anything that damages wood, especially structural components. Um, that is a drain pipe, cast iron, four inch drain pipe coming out of the wall. I think I know what it is. It's probably the garage floor. Yep. So I think there's a garage in there, has a floor drain. It just comes out. Ah, that's fine. I'm not going to call it. Um, window panes are real old, single window panes, heavily sealed. Uh, silicone to keep the panes in their place. Um, you're not required to inspect the yards, essentially, but I do. Um, see that thing way in the back in the left? Yeah, I'm getting back there. I want to see what that is. Um, deteriorated paint. That's um, a big chocolate cake for carpenter ants. Right? They, they just love that stuff. That's like sugar and food and nesting and... Uh, delicious. And that's for termites. So they're just, um, and that's way in the back of the yard. Um, so I inspect things that are beyond 10 feet from the property house. I, I go all over because I've got kids, so I know what to look for. I'm looking for holes and trip hazards and groundhogs and all that stuff. I know I'm very familiar with what's going on in the, in the yard. If you don't know, and you want to, you want to inspect, let's say you want to know about trees. How to inspect trees. Guess what internet she has? We have a free online course about how to inspect trees. And we had experts contribute to the course. Experts in tree knowledge um, and tree inspections. So it's, and that's just fun. Oh, there it is. Natchi, here's how you find the tree course. It's free online to members, right? You go to our education page, natchi.org slash education. You go into the search field at the left, and you type in tree, or you type in radon, or you type in roof, or moisture, or any topic, or type in your state, or province, see what comes up. So that's kind of fun. The shed in the back, hidden, I uh, didn't even see it way back there, it was about a half an acre back, um, deteriorated, poor condition. Now you're thinking, why am I going all the way back there? This is only going to take me a minute. And the picture is worth a thousand words. So it's not like I'm writing a thousand words about this little shed. I'm going to take a picture with my inspection report on my mobile software, right? And it's going to be easy. Boom, it's in a report. Boom. A couple minutes. I'm not really wasting any time. I'm being very efficient. I'm back to the house. And I see dense vegetation and a stump right next to the house. Uh, that invites wood-destroying um, organisms, uh, infestation. And um, maybe there's a root thing going on, but um, these homes tend to be built really well. 
And now I'm getting to the meat of the home inspection. Roof, exterior, that's fine. But I want to take my client to the heating and cooling system. That's where all the fun is, right? That's the lungs of the home if it's a furnace. Um, so I'm all excited. When I see this, I know what this is. This is an old thermostat. <laughs> I don't even know which one's the heating system. I'll figure it out. But don't be so um, hard on yourself, right? If you don't know, if a client is saying, well, let's turn, the, let's turn the heater on. Which one is it? And you go, I don't know. Don't, don't guess. If you don't know, I had no problem saying, I have no idea. Uh, I don't know which one you want to try. Let's flip a coin. Top one. Okay. And let's turn the top one, right? The, the bottom one um, is connected to an old uh, humidifier, I believe, in this house. We'll take a look. And uh, it doesn't work either. So I would uh, say that's a uh, minor defect. The old thermostats uh, just waste energy. You could save about 50 bucks a month on, with a programmable, um, efficient uh, thermostat. So um, uh, a month or a year. Um, and that's the old um, humidistat there. Okay, uh, I've gotten way too far without answering any questions. So let's take some time, about a uh, couple minutes to answer some questions. Yeah, and we've done, get out, an hour and 12 minutes. That's pretty good. Mm. And at this point, uh, we're about an hour and so uh, into the webinar. But at this point in the home inspection, excuse me. <clears throat> Remember that it started at 8 o'clock? Down from the roof, shaking the hands, 8.30. Exterior. I did another probably 40, 50 pictures, so now I'm at 100 pictures, and I'm uh, about 9 o'clock, right? The, the beginning of uh, a home inspection is somewhat slow sometimes, right? Because you're getting a really good idea of the condition of the entire home when you look at the roof. The roof really is um, a great indication, in my experience, of what's going on in the entire rest of the house. If the roof is shot, uh, the inside is going to be not all that peachy clean. So um, the roof takes some time and the exterior takes some time, but mm, maybe I'm inside the house at 8.45. Let's just say I'm 8.45 below nine, uh, before 9 o'clock. I've got to get going here, right? So I don't want to double track. I don't want to inspect all this stuff coming up. Um, heating system, um, air conditioning, there's no air conditioning. Um, uh, hot water source, um, electrical structure. I don't want to do all that without my client because my client's going to say, hey, can you take me through the house? I'll be like, oh, I got to do this again. So I'm going to grab my client. And I'm going to tell them what I'm going to do. I'm going through this once and I'd like you to come along and I'm going to write a report as we go. And you pick out anything you want me to look at and I'll look at it for you. That's always good. It, feels like they're in control of what's going on, but actually you are because remember, you're trying to get that denominator time really small so you can make big money. Sorry, you're in business to make money. You're, in, you're gonna do good. You're gonna do well by doing good things, but you can't stay in business if you don't make money. So you have to make money unless you're running a nonprofit incredibly, you know? Um, so. Um, you have to think of these things. Time management is another one of them. So I'm excited to be here standing in front of this. I know I'm on time. 8.45. I'm 45 minutes into it and I'm at the heating system. I'm good. Uh, oh, questions. Um, uh, Fred says, New York also does not recognize online CE. I know. It's absolutely terrible. It is the worst thing that a state can do for their... Um, there are citizens. There are um, barriers set up by the state to prevent affordable, easy access to continuing education so that licensed professionals in that state can grow in their knowledge, skills, and abilities and continue to learn to provide better services for their clients. Yep. No, that's no, that's not a good idea in New York. No, we don't want it to be online and affordable. Nope. 
have to be expensive and you have to sit in class. You have to blow off work and sit in a classroom all day. That sounds like fun. Uh, Alejandro, what about California? I love California. I don't know what that means. Love California, especially Southern California. San Francisco is a really cool place. Don't forget liability insurance in some states like New York, $250 license. In, oh, states that regulate professionals love fees. Yeah, yeah. So let's gather up all the fees you can think of, assuming you can take the majority of your training and certification and licensing through Energy. You're really, you know, a thousand bucks, 2000, let's say $5,000. Let's just go crazy. Five grand, right? That's pretty, you know, like to, to start a profitable business in a couple months for five grand, not bad. I can't think of another company that can do that, you know, where you can go from any background into another industry and dominate within the first year for five grand. You can do that. I know you can do it because I did it, right? So I want to share how I did it. It was a while back, but industry really hasn't changed. Some of the technology has, but the methods by which a business is run hasn't changed in, since they started creating corporations. Insurance is a decent expense as well. Right. So I, um, if you go to nachi.org slash insurance, um, that's InterNACHI's insurance partner. They, that's an insurance company that provides E&O and liability and business insurance um, for home inspectors, and they recognize InterNACHI members. And I believe the policy is that they recognize them because InterNACHI home inspectors are well-trained and certified and are required to take continuing education and um, are backed up by online agreements and other kind of liability-reducing resources that really insurance company love. You know, it's easy. Um, we have so many resources to handle a complaint, for example. Um, it, there's so many steps before someone actually will file a complaint. I mean, anybody can sue you, but if you take them through the process of handling their, listening to them, absorbing their information, gathering information, and starting to respond to them, by that time, you know, anything else comes up. I've been sued in small claims court a couple times. And I just had internet resources. I had the standards of practice, my inspection report, and the online agreement system to back me up. And that's all I needed to win in front of the judge in about five, 10 minutes. Yep. So you don't have to really worry about that. Now, if I was in a regulated state that required ins uh, insurance, internet has an insurance partner, right? Nachi.org slash insurance. Um, let's see, is there any inf information on developing business plans? Hmm, yes. So I think it's worth it to create a slide here. <laughs> you go to natchi.org uh, insurance and then natchi.org education and type in business. Okay. Roop. Uh, so that's where you get insurance quote real quick. Uh, I think they said to me last time I talked to the insurance company, it was 1500 is a good estimate on a national scale. It's like 1500 to 2500, depending on wh who you are and where you are and all that stuff. Um, you have to get a quote though. Uh, natchee.org slash insurance and natchee.org slash education and you go there and you type in business and the home inspection business course, which is free online and open to everyone. You don't have to be a member. It's open to everybody. Um, it's a good resource. And they have, uh, that course goes through um, the traditional conventional business plan. Um, some are, um, some folks favor writing a business plan. Um, I'm not all that crazy about all the details of a business plan, but it's it's a good exercise so that you start to think about all the components of your business. And um, I bet it helps you become faster in developing a successful plan because there's probably a lot of things you haven't thought of, especially if you've never created your own business and run it, right? So 
you need something to work from. And there's a, essentially a checklist, an online checklist to develop a um, home inspection business, a successful one. And all the resources that Internet she provides are integrated into that course. It's an it's a excellent course. Excellent course, if I have to say. Uh, Thomas, got it. RD, no. Uh, Jessica, drone inspections. I think we talked about this before. For me personally, drones are fun. If you were in um, my friendly competition, we we met at the every month at the Internachi chapter meeting. You know, we had coffee. I'd be talking about how you're, you know, um, flying drones over people's houses, you know, and running into trees and stuff. And you can't take a picture up close because you're afraid to the, get close to a roof. And you'll be talking to me about slipping off a roof and getting up on a ladder and hitting an electrical line with a ladder and electrocuting myself. We'd have a lot of fun. But the point is, what does your client want? Client wants to know the condition of the roof. And if that means you're doing drones, good. Uh, for me, I want to get up close and personal because I've installed roofs with my hands and hammers and fasteners, right? And I know how to install a roof. And if I can just get up there close, I'll be able to tell how this roof was installed. So I have that knowledge, right? That I need to kind of get up at, up there. It's I'm almost like required. A drone picture with 4K resolution just really isn't me, right? So we'd have fun in competing in providing the value to our clients. Would you be hired or would I be hired, right? Ladder guy, walk on a roof or drone lady, right? Um, that's fun. In fact, I recommend uh, spying. Go here and spy on your competition, inspectorseek.com. So go to inspectorseek.com, type in your zip code and spy on your competition. See what their website says. Hopefully they have a website. If they don't have a website, I bet they have a favorite TV show that they're watching, right? Instead of making a website, right? That's what you want, actually. You want all of your competition to have their favorite TV show and they binge on watching old TV shows or what, I don't know what they do, right? I just got a TV this year just to watch the Steelers and they didn't go to the Super Bowl. So I'll put it away. I won't watch it until next year. I have no use for a TV. No use. I, I just grew up that way. I've, my children have never watched TV on a regular basis. Um, the first TV was, you know, in 10 years was, and so I have all this extra time to do what? Well, a lot of things. One of them is, in business, is to use that extra time that you've saved by being efficient on the job to maybe working at night. Yeah. You know, you're in business. It's your business. It's on your shoulders. You should probably work a little at night. <laughs> uh, my brother says uh, one of the best things you could do is to go to um, a hardware store, like Home Depot is a really good one, and go down that aisle. I think it's aisle six where the hammers are and get a hammer, really big 32 ounce hammer, right? S wing hammer with a metal uh, handle, you know? and smash your TV, right? So you don't watch TV. Because if you have an hour at night, you have a decision where you're gonna waste it or put it, invest it into your business. And if it's an hour at night, do some math. Hour at night, five hours a week, 40, uh, no, 20 hours, right? 20 hours a month, 240 hours a year. 240 hours divided by 40 hour a week, that's six. That's six weeks, full time, 40 hours a week, that you're ahead of your competition at the end of the year. Your competition is eating popcorn and watching their favorite TV show, and you are six weeks ahead of your competition in anything you want, marketing, business strategies, training, continuing education. You're six, six weeks, that's a month and a half ahead of your competition. It's like hiring someone for a month and a half to work 40 hours a week, six weeks on marketing. You know how far you'll get in your business according to the people in your local chapter? They'll be wondering why you're doing so well. 
and you'll be asking them, what's your favorite TV show, right? Get them hooked on TV. That's probably the best, best advice you can give to your competition. Where, sometimes I do this, I get off track. I don't even know what I'm looking at here. Uh, Andrew says, what do you think about using a drone? Uh, I think we've covered that, right? Okay. Um, Terry, do you exceed the standards of practice on most all things, or are you selective in the things you exceed? Um, legal counsel, Mark Cohen, International Legal Counsel, advises all International members, um, if you're going to exceed the standards of practice, exceed it in the same way for all of your clients, right? So I try to get up on the roof, and if I can't get up on the roof, I tell them, I usually get up on the roof, and I couldn't. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to inspect it in different ways or disclaim it. Um, that's an example. Um, Daniel, what do you think about drone inspections? <laughs> I think we answered that. Uh, what was that roof slope app? I don't know. Mm, uh, let's see. Mm, pitch factor. P-I-T-C-H-F-A-C-T-O-R. Pitch factor. What is the slope roof app called? Pitch Factor. <laughs> what is the name of the app you just mentioned? <laughs> Pitch Factor. <laughs> uh, how do you walk that line of providing the best inspection for your client and not turning off the, their real estate agent at the same time? Oh, <clears throat> agents, right? I'm working for my client. My client pays me. I'm working for them. I'm biased towards them, their needs. They come first. There's no such thing as a deal killer. It really isn't. I don't know how it started or who keeps going on and saying that name, but it's just, we, we don't kill deals. I'll give you a reason. Uh, there's hardly anything you could say that can kill a deal. If a deal doesn't go through, it's likely the real estate agent's fault because they just haven't found the right buyer for that home. And that wasn't the right buyer for that home. If the deal goes south, there was something else going on. It's hardly anything. I'll tell you why. Because by the time they hire you, but by the time you shake your client's hand, right, at the inspection for the first time they meet you, right, they have fallen in love with the house. Because imagine about three, six months ago, they started looking for a home online and looking for a real estate agent and looking for a bank and working to get their finances ready, right? Getting pre-approved, find the right real estate agent, maybe the second one, maybe the third one, driving with them in their car, going to offices, open houses, months are passing by, right? Online, Zillow, online resources, emailing people, submitting uh, documents, submitting um, uh, uh, bids, right? Finding the right neighborhood, finding the right school system, finding the right street, finding the right house. They found the right house. They put a bid on it. It was accepted and they're ready to go. They hire a home inspector to tell them what? Is there anything really wrong with the house? That's all they want to know because they've fallen in love with it. They've already made plans to renovate the bathroom and the kitchen and build a deck on the back. They are, their hearts are in it. There's hardly anything a home inspector can say to kill that deal. If the deal goes south, it's because of something else, you know? And the real estate agent really has the burden of finding the right buyer for the right property. And that's really difficult. I mean, I give them a lot of respect oh, to work for that commission. That's, it's a lot of work, right? To respect your you're equal, professional. They're, they're licensed, they're a professional, and so are you, right? They have clients, and so do you. I never call my clients customers. They're not buying pizza from me, that's a customer. They're not buying a hammer from me, that's a customer. I have clients, I have a client base, just like that real estate professional. They're regulated, I am too. They're sort of, I am too. They took his name, I am too. I take 24 hours of continuing education every year. I, I don't think a real estate agent has that kind of requirement. So you're probably taking more CE than they are, right? That's a requirement that you beat them on. So think you're not a deal killer. Lift your head up high, shoulders back, chest out. You're professionals. There's nothing I'm going to say 
that should kill this deal. If it goes south, there's something else going on because these people, my clients, my clients love this house. They told me when we met in the driveway, right? Now we have a hole in the roof. Hey, that's not a deal killer. It's a hole. You hire a roof, roofing contractor, you patch it, a few hundred bucks, you get to live in the house still, right? Or maybe you negotiate it away. That's your job. Yeah, I never pulled a punch with a real estate agent. I actually fired a real estate agent once. Um, John was his name, big football guy. And uh, yeah, we told him he's fired. We're not going to work with him anymore. He was like, well, he didn't understand. Like, well, I, you know, you can't fire me. I I can't fire me. My broker hires me. No, well, you don't understand. We're not going to work with you anymore. If we see you on the job thing, we're not going to do the inspection because you're so terrible to work with, right? And it's really fun to say no to agents and no to clients too. Sometimes a client just isn't the right client for you and you have to say no to some people. Don't just keep saying yes. Maybe in the beginning you gotta, you know, grit your teeth and say yes and take anyone's business. But, you know, it's, it comes to a certain point where, you know, you're feeling confident and you don't throw any punches. And I love it when a real estate agent says grandfathered. Well, that's grandfathered. Or you're a deal killer. That's a good one too. Yep. So I think it's possible to have a really good relationship with a, a network of real estate professionals. That's actually where all my business came from because um, my goal in my business was to have 30 real estate agents who worked well with each inspector. Because if 30 real estate agents, uh, half of them closed on a house a month, that's pretty good work for my home inspector, right? So that was the goal. That's where all my business came from. So we, we had that. We, we had that opportunity. Uh, that doesn't ladder look like three feet, but oh, it probably wasn't. Don't look, right? Um, can you recommend an inspection drone? No. Sorry, Ben. Steady unit is about to begin. I know. Um, the video recording uh, is available. It'll be online in Nachi TV tomorrow, and I'll email a link to everybody. Uh, what cloud based reports are there? Um, I would say all the good ones <laughs> um, have cloud based reports. That's simply where we're heading. Um, nobody reads a printed out one, although this is how I did it. This is exactly, I'm not lying to you, this is how exactly I carried a printer to the kitchen, set up the printer, and I printed out every report in black and white. And I had a fast printer, a couple minutes, and I had a 50, 60 page inspection report printed out. I did this on every inspection and a summary report. And inside this binder, I put a home maintenance book. So this is a home maintenance book. This is InterNACHI's home maintenance book which is now fully customizable um, for the same price. And then these pockets here, you can put you know, your business card here and other rack cards and things like that, information in there. And I actually gave weight to my inspection report at the end of the report, uh, and at the end of the inspection. Um, nowadays, I'd probably do both. I'm, I'm pretty crazy. I would never buy this. I would never invest in this either. This is this is like if you put this all together, it's about five, six, seven dollars in material costs. If you th think about the ink. I would just raise the, the fee of my inspection report. Of my inspection, sorry. By ten bucks. Instead of two hundred and fifty, charge two hundred and sixty. Right? Allow your clients to purchase their own printed report bound just for them, right? For 10 bucks. If it cost me $8, they just bought their own binder and printing and my coffee for the day. In fact, same thing with the infrared camera. This cost me, uh, an internet team member can get this for a few hundred dollars through Inspector Outlet, but I would raise my fee a few dollars so that my clients over the next year can pay for this. I'm not going to pay for that. I'm not going to add to my overhead. No. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to pay for the customized home maintenance book $2.70 for every inspection. No. I'm going to raise my fee $5 and allow my clients to purchase their own home maintenance book and a cup of coffee and a latte for me. Right? You have to think of value. Why would they do that? Because the value proposition that I'm providing is worth the cost. 
And if the amount of value that you're providing is much greater than the cost, then it's a good decision for your client to hire you, right? It's also, it's also works in business too. So if the value of InterNACHI is overwhelming to the, in relation to the cost, $49 a month, then it's a good decision for your business as well. That's why we provide a ton of stuff for all of our members for one low price. Same thing with your client. You have to figure out how to create value. So in my business, I was the guy who um, uh, had tall ladders and got up on every roof and also had um, free home maintenance books and I bound and printed the report at the end of the inspection, every inspection, and an infrared camera. I used to do free thermal infrared scans on every home inspection. Free, free. I never sold a $150 service, ancillary service, but I just added value to my core service, home inspection service. If I can add incredible value for a good cost, price, then I'm going to win in the market and I'll be able to demand higher prices than you who's watching TV or State of the Union. <laughs> so you have to think of that. How are you going to beat me? You're going to beat me in the market by providing incredible amount of value. Uh, do you, I'm not wearing a watch. Do you know you should look up, can I give you homework tonight? Um, look up the word commodity. Commodity, right? Um, we're essentially in that business, or we don't want to be, right? Commodity is uh, something, a product or service that's um, interchangeable with all the rest of them, right? And a, a good example is a watch. Ever go to a store and go to the men's jewelry and look at all the men's watches? Um, the, the secret is that it costs about the same for, to produce any of the watches. So it costs a certain amount of money to produce this cheap watch for $10 and this really expensive watch for $500. Did you know that? It's about the same. It's about the, it varies, right? But it's, it's essentially the same. Why can this manufacturer or producer charge $500 and this one only 10? It's the value proposition. Has, they both work the same way. They both <laughs> tell, the, tell the time. They both cost the same amount of money to produce. They both are on my wrist. It's, they do the same. It's the, it, they're a commodity. But this one demands $500. Why? If you can figure that one out, you are going to be wealthy in life, in your business, right? Because the value of getting this is much more... It's why, um, it's why uh, if I go to a rent, a Hertz rental, and there are many cars to rent, but I choose the one that's more expensive because I feel like it has features that would uh, benefit me in some way. Maybe heated seats or something, or, or, or has that camera that goes backwards, right? Um, when you go backwards. Something like that. The, the value proposition of getting that more expensive vehicle, that SUV, um, I'm willing to pay for that value proposition. They're, all the rental cars are going to take me from point A to point B. All home inspectors are going to essentially do the same thing. They're going to inspect the roof according to the standards of practice and code of ethics. We're all going to do the same thing. How is it that one inspector can demand twice as much as the other inspector, right? It's value. You have to convince the person paying you that you're worth it. And that takes marketing strategy. And that's why InterNACHI, I come back to InterNACHI, InterNACHI has a marketing, a member marketing department, a member marketing department. It's a marketing department, not for InterNACHI, it's for members. So there's seven, full-time staff people. They're highly creative and professional in design and marketing for home inspectors, right? And they do everything from consultation 
advice, logo design, marketing design, websites, anything you have, and also strategies. How do you sell an ancillary service to make more money during an inspection, right? It's, it's about, uh, can I tell you one more story? Umbrellas and, um, uh, I'll tell you the umbrella story later. There, there's a rainstorm. Ah, uh, never mind. Uh, uh, I know what I want to tell you. Where's that book? Where's that book that tells the story? Oh, my brother's going to kill me. Where's his stack? Where's his stack book? Oh, darn it. I, know, I took more things out of this area recently. Let me take you to your URL. I know the URL. You're going to love this book. It's a free book. I think that's it. Yes. Okay. So there's a free book that you can get. It's called Stacks, which means um, you're going to make stacks of cash. Um, it's written by the founder of Internachi, my brother, Nick Armico, and it's a home inspector's guide to increasing gross revenue. And there are some excellent keys in there, strategies, tips to increase gross revenue. Don't be stuck making the same amount of money year after year. Always be thinking about, about increasing your um, gross revenue. When, if you can do that, then you can also think about, at the same time, increasing your profit margin, which is that extra juicy stuff that makes you wealthy, right? So. Um, that's, that's covered in this book. It's a, a nice guide and also in the home inspection business course, and also the, um, member marketing uh, department can help you with that. And I've got ideas too, and we can talk about that later. Mm, looking at the clock and looking at all the questions. Uh, Ricardo on your inspection report, do you mention any repairs made to a flat roof? Yes. Um, any, if I see a defect in any system or component, I'll put that picture in there. I might even point to something because I don't have time to draw arrows. Um, and then I'll, I'll make a recommendation. And it's in red. All of my defect comments are in red, right? Red and bold. Because there's nothing I can say to kill a deal. So I might as well make it red so that it pops out. Defects are in red ink. That's just a personal thing that I do. Uh, is it possible to see this? PA inspection in its entirety, it'd be great to see how to describe all the defects. Yeah, um, we put all of the inspections um, online. Uh, this class is being video recorded, but the reports also are available as well. Um, uh, can we see what the finished report looks like? Yes, I'll try to put the finished report online uh, right along with the produced video uh, recording of this class on Natchi TV. Does Spectoria give discounts for members? Yes. Uh, like how many? Yes. To Spectora? Yeah. You should go to just Spectora. I'm not a, I don't care what you do with what software you use. I don't care if you use Spectora or not. I, I'm just telling you, I'm just sharing what I'm doing right now. I'm learning. I learned HomeGage, great software. I learned, uh, works on PCs. Well, um, I learned Home Inspector Pro, um, great software. It works on, um, iOS device, um, Apple devices and PCs and mobile devices. And Spectora, um, is a good, uh, it's one of it's the it's the software I'm using right now, and I highly recommend it. Um, let's see. I'm looking through the the questions. Is that okay? Um, handrails handrail codes depend upon state and municipality. That's true. Um, the international residential code, the IRC, um, is what international training is all is based upon, um, and and um, but. Um, local codes trump national or international codes, pun intended. Local codes overrule all national codes because it's up to your lo local municipality, your township, um, your county, your state on how, um, on which codes, if any, are applied to construction standards, right? And it's really uh, the authority having jurisdiction. Ever hear of that? A H J. Your authority having jurisdiction. Your your township code inspector really has authority. So the 2018 IRC says um, uh, the, the dryer vent pipe. They changed the dryer vent pipe to be longer. It's not 25 feet. Now it's 35 
because they were making this big, these big McMansions, right? So they need the dryer vent pipe length maximum to be longer. So they just changed it in the code. Let's make the code longer instead of 25 feet, 35 feet, and then we'll shorten it with the bends, uh, 90 degree bends and 45 degree bends. The uh, local township inspector may look at a code, national code, and say, nope, in this township, we don't care how long it is. It could be 100 feet. And that's it. <sighs> you got to live with it. That's the uh, local authority having jurisdiction. So as a home inspector, but remember, as a home inspector, you're like a wild gun, right? You can say just about anything and rec make recommendations, right? You're regulated in some things, but hardly anything, uh, I think Texas, you're not really allowed to quote code, right? So um, that's one state that regulates it that I know of. There might be other states. Other than that, you're basically a free bird to say whatever you want based upon your opinion. And I was probably one of the best, easiest, easy call on that one. I would just, I don't think that's safe. I don't think that's right. I'm calling it out. And people would get all upset, like, oh, what's the code? I don't care what the code is. And the handrail is a really important part. Um, let's see. Mm, uh, uh, mm, skip that. Um, Joshua asks, do you do radon testing yourself or sub it out? Nope. We had all of our home inspectors become, um, in Pennsylvania, it's a regulated thing to be a radon tester. So, um, uh all of our inspectors, you know, the goal was to do a home inspection, a radon test, and a termite. Home inspection, if you did 100% home inspections, 75% um, of them, they tended to be with a radon test, and 50% um, had a wood-destroying organism, and then it went down to, like, water quality and lead and uh, things like that. So we wanted our inspections to be at least three essentially inspections in one. A home inspection, a radon test, and a water um, WDO, termite inspection. Because that was about 600 bucks. And I wanted everyone to make 600 bucks for every trip. So if you do two inspections, you're bringing home at least a grand. If, if a home inspector is working for you and they're bringing home a grand, gross, that's pretty good. You can figure a lot out. Uh, with that kind of gross revenue coming from one home inspector. And you do that by ancillary inspections. You can keep increasing the rate of your home inspection, right? We were up to, I think, about 400 bucks. Some were doing $500 for a home inspection. Well, you know, if you add ancillary inspections, that's like gravy. That's like profit. Ancillary inspections are profit, almost pure profit. If they don't take more time, if they only take a few minutes, of your time, then that's probably a really good idea to offer that ancillary service. And you have to offer it. And if that means getting your folks certified in radon, that's the way to do it. Yep. Mold was really big too. I was impressed by mold. I still remember my first mold inspector. I wasn't doing mold. I was doing a home inspection. And here comes this person coming in, pump thing, air something, and out in like a half an hour. And I asked, how much did you just make? It was $350. I'm like, what? Yeah, I almost immediately became a mold inspector, right? That person was making just as much as I was in a heck of a less time. Well, what am I doing? Doing a home inspection. I should be doing mold. So it's really dependent upon the services that are in demand in your area as well. You have to figure that one out. Um, you're welcome, Patrick. James, Spector, right? Uh, Parcel. Thanks for the information. Got it. Pitch grade. Yep. Yeah. Don't use drones. Pitch grade. Would you work over? Would you go over the paperwork that your client signs? Does it protect you from liability? Does Internachi have sample customer forms that we could use? Oh man, Internachi has like a legal Zoom for home inspectors. Um, you want to go to? Oh, I should write it. Hold on. Hold on. Here. Oh, I know all these URLs. Mm. Come on. Um, boop. So you want to go here to find everything that I'm talking about. If you can't find it, just go there. That's probably a pretty good start to find everything. Natchez.org slash insurance. Um, Natchez.org slash 
um, documents is for the legal documents and natcha.org slash online agreement uh, is the main online agreement system that you want to take a look at. It's a free online agreement system. It's the agreement that you send to your client describing your services and cost and they sign it and you get it back and then you go to the house. You don't step on the property until you get some kind of document signed, that agreement. And it's fully customizable. It starts with templates and then it's customized to your company, to your service, to what you want to provide, ancillary services, and what your local business attorney um, tweaks on the agreement. Every You should have a local business attorney. Uh, they know all the judges. They know all the magistrates. They know all the all the other attorneys and lawyers, and they know you know local things that you don't. So getting a business advice, it was really good for our business. We had a local business attorney giving us advice, um, and it really helped out in a couple of situations. Uh, questions? Um, wrong. Agents have CE requirements too. Right. But it's um, 12. My point was, Internet GC requirements are 24 hours a year, right? Ask the next real estate agent that you meet, what are their CE requirements? It's going to be about 12 every two years, I bet. Which one's more difficult? To be a home inspector is much more difficult. Um, uh, James, can you just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm skipping a couple of guys, okay? And, and ladies. Uh, do you give all the pictures to the client? Parcel asks, yes. I give all the pictures, all the videos, everything to the client, totally transparent. What if you took a picture of a hole in the roof and you forgot to put it in the report, but you gave the picture to the client? Well, geez, I don't think that's gonna happen, really? Is that your, then you need to slow down and do your reports slower, right? Because if you're making that mistake, then you need to go backwards a little bit, right? Cancel the next home inspection and do a little bit more training and more practicing on how to write a report, right? If that's your fear, right? You have to get over that, right? Um, so take as many pictures as you can and put them in the report as many as you can, but provide all that stuff. The secret is um, most people don't read the report. They give it to other people to read and share. I just got a, they're at work. I just got a home inspection yesterday. Look, they gave us this entire thing. Really? How did it go? Pretty good. Uh, and they jumped right to the summary. He found a hole in the roof and took a picture of it. That's about it. And they, they look through this. It's not my client that looks through this. It's my client's friends and family members and coworkers. And they go, hmm, I'm looking for a home inspector. This home inspector is pretty good. It's a marketing piece. It's my best marketing piece. And it's really, Designed not for my my clients. It's like counterintuitive. It's designed for my clients, friends, and neighbors, and family members, and coworkers because they're going to pass this around. My best marketing piece is going to be passed around to everyone in my client's base network. That's what this is for, right? So that's what I learned after a while. No one actually reads my inspection report. My clients don't read it. Um, they look at the summary. It's my summary is really good. Um, the agents love it, you know, highlights the major things, major defects, material defects, these things that need to be fixed or attended to or negotiated over prior to moving in, right? And they are going to move in because, again, there's hardly anything I can say that killed this deal. Okay, I think we should keep going. Do you want to keep going? It's been two hours. Whatever you guys want. You want me to keep going? Yeah? All right. Oh, really? New Jersey is 40 hours in two years? That's excellent. That is really good. Guess what internet she's is? <laughs> 20, 24 hours every year, right? So we have the, to be an internet home inspector is the one of the highest statuses you could tell another professional. Seriously. I mean, it's difficult to get in. The examinations are really difficult. Certification is tough. You know, um, it's not easy. And then you have to maintain your status as an internationally certified home inspector, but doing 24 hours of continuing education every year. Phew. 
Now the nice thing is, Internachi provides all that stuff, hundreds of, I think we're in thousands, sorry, thousands of hours of uh, CE um, online and free for our members. But yeah, you know? So if you're getting in a battle with a real estate agent about professional, professionalism and continuing education pops up, I've got a good speech for them, you know? I take a picture of, so this is an oil-fired furnace, right? I talked about the oil, right? I just think it's crazy that it sucks, th that red box turns the oil into a mist, ignites it, flames shoot inside a, a, a barrel, a, like a refractory box. It gets really hot and air passes through it. And uh, that's essentially the heat exchanger and air passes around it and heats up the house. And, you know, hot air is, is blown around the house in the wintertime. There's no air conditioning on this unit. I take a picture of every manufacturing label. I've never actually used it. Um, I can't remember the last time I looked up the size of an air conditioner in tonnage or something, divide by 12, or uh, look at the serial number to actually find the, the week of the year that it was manufactured. Um, but, you know, I had that information. And that information is sometimes supplied in other areas like there, right? So the installer just wrote down when the, the place was, uh, uh, when the furnace was installed. Shut off switch. Oh, so I take a picture of the system and then I take a picture of the components of the system because that's how my inspection report uh, checklist on my mobile device is set up. I describe the system and then I describe each component of the system and I don't make mistakes. I just go through the checklist. I check that, 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 check that. Okay, I'm done. Go to the next system, right? So I know this is right 8.30, 8.45. I'm going to be done in about 10 minutes with this furnace. If there are defects, I mean, this is a quick, you don't dwell over a furnace. I mean, it's basic components. You turn it on, turn it off, done. Uh, shut off switch. Oh, burner. Oop, oop, oop. Shut off switch. Um, thermostat control. Burner. Burner port. Valve. The humidifier that's unplugged, connected to that old thermostat upstairs. Um, connection, um, this is where the, all the exhaust gases go up into the chimney stack. So that's the flue connection pipe and a damper on the oil fired burner um, for that category furnace. There's an the air filter location. It's in the right direction, disposable, done. I'm, on, I'm onto the oil storage tank. I like kind of like an ancillary component of this system. And there's watermarks, and the watermarks are black. So I think it's actually oil with water carrying the oil across the concrete floor. And it smells like oil. And it looks like there's oil too. The belly of the storage tank for the oil is often rusted completely and wet with oil. Often. There's a lot of leaking oil tanks in the United States, inside people's homes. This is not a good indoor air quality issue. This is a bad one. A lot of homes are not healthy. So I like to tap on the metal legs to see if they're deteriorated. And often, in my experience, they were. And this tank is leaking. It's wet with oil. It's dripping. It's rusted. It's black on the outside. There shouldn't be no oil on the outside of an oil tank unless it's leaking somewhere, like a pinhole. Oil filter, just like on a car. Oil valve, so you can turn it off. Now I'm in the garage. That's it. Um, a few minutes at the furnace. No big deal. Done. My client is with me. For some reason, I moved out of my comfort zone. I wanted to go to the hot water tank and the electrical panel and the structure. Now I'm in the garage. There must have been some reason. I can't remember, but I'm in the garage now. This garage door won't open. The spring coil, there's something wrong with it. Defect. Done. I don't have to thoroughly diagnose the problem. The door did not open. I think it's this. Defect. Further evaluation. The other door opened, but there's a uh, two by four lying on the rail. That's no good. I think it's holding up the ceiling, which is a fire hazard. Shouldn't have combustible materials like this exposed in a garage. A lot of people work on their cars, battery sparks, boom, right? You need a, a firewall that separates the garage from the rest of the house, especially if there's 
um, living quarters attached to it. And it, the idea is to give the fire department about a half an hour to get to the garage and put out the fire before it moves through the building. So a lot of, a lot of like insulation is just hanging exposed. We really need some drywall here, big holes. So going right up through the ceiling. So the garage must be separated from other areas of the house and to separate a garage from the house and attics, there's a material and it has to be at least a half inch gypsum board drywall or equivalent on the garage side. And we don't have any of that in the garage to separate the garage from habitable rooms above the garage. Cause fire goes up has to be a little bit thicker, five eighths inch type X gypsum board or equivalent. And for any structures supporting the floor or ceiling assemblies, the material should be at least a half inch thick drywall or equivalent. And for a garage that's close to another house, you need gypsum board on that, on those exterior walls. So I just take a lot of pictures and I put those defects in the report with a lot of pictures, a lot of videos. And when I'm done with this garage inspection, I'm actually done with that section of the report as well. The door in between the garage, attached garage and living quarters, while the doorway openings between the garage and the house must have solid wood doors, at least one and three eighths inch thick, solid or honeycomb core steel doors, at least one and three eighths inch thick, or 20 minute fire rated doors equipped with self-closing or automatic closing devices. And you gotta look for a label to identify this type of door and look for a self-closing device. Water faucets in the garage should be frost proof. proof and um, uh, that should be, there's, there's a missing handle, big deal, but defect. Windows, doors, garage receptacles, all receptacles in the garage should be GFCI protected. There's a section, my favorite section in the IRC, International Residential Code 2018, describes AFCIs and GFCIs. And um, the interesting thing um, that switched from, uh, last version of the IRC to 2018 is the receptacles within six feet of the top inside edge of the sink bowl and outside edge of the bathtub or shower stall. They got the inside and outside um, in there. It's kind of fun. Uh, and every receptacle in the garage, all garage receptacles. Um, the other thing is um, kitchen counter receptacles need to be GFCI protected, but also the outlet for the dishwasher. So that section, E3902 from the 2018 IRC. Um, plastic on the window as a replacement. And uh, there you go. The garage door um, itself, the rails, are held up by these little pieces of wood with hardly any fastening. I mean, it's so weak. It's incredible. So it's a homemade job right here. It's not a professional installation and the door itself is um, rotten. There's some settlement cracks with the large concrete lintels, um, but I'm not concerned about it. Um, but I'll, I'll note it in the report, and there's that floor drain. Remember the drain outside? There's the floor drain, and it's clogged. Doorbell, that's a defect, minor defect. It has not public water, but a well, and the well is somewhere outside, buried, I don't know, so I'm gonna mark it. I didn't see it outside. Remember, I walked the yard, didn't come up. So I don't know where the wellhead is. They have to get the, the, um, that information from the homeowner or the seller. All new systems, all new components. New bladder tank, really nice. Valves, components, everything's new, dated, perfect. Turn it on, turn it off. That's the main water setup valve. That's water coming in. Now I think of water going out, sewage going out. There's the clean out. Uh, cast iron. Um, cast iron is kind of fun to inspect because you never know. Uh, it tends to corrode from inside out. And so you look for pinholes on the outside and get your screwdriver and stick it in there and uh, try to crack the cast iron. Uh, if I break something during a home inspection, um, I don't take responsibility for it. I'm there to find things that break in my hand. Um, that's my job. Um, and that is a leaking toilet flange at that cast iron drain. Um, the valves are all um, uh, leaking as well, old water shutoff valves. 
we have dissimilar uh, drains pipe um, and a, a bad uh, mechanical connection. Um, can't really glue uh, black and white pipes together. <laughs> they have to be uh, connected together mechanically, and there's certain uh, UPS labeled um, uh, connection um, uh, fittings with um, the metal in the middle. Um, well, it's in a plumbing course. That's leaking. Uh, that's leaking. That's leaking. That's leaking. That's missing. Hot water. So whenever I find a leaking valve, it's real easy with my mobile device. Just go to plumbing, valves, leaking valve, picture, and location. If I can do location real quick. And I don't type anything. Oh, I forgot to show you. But you just, you know, the, the voice to text feature is on every mobile device. Hot water source, 50 gallon hot water tank, electric, there's an electric line, grounded, dated, sized, hot, uh, shutoff valve, TPR valve is not extended to the floor, easy defect, it's not leaking electrical. Electrical, you're not required to remove the dead front cover. You're not, it's hazardous, don't do it. I tend to exceed the standards of practice in this way for all my clients. Um, 30 amp shutoff valve for the hot water tank, which is on a, an energy uh, saver meter. Um, the idea was that the hot water tank would heat up water at night um, when no one is using it, and then it would be used during the day without turning on. It doesn't work anymore. Um, that kind of system, um, hot water is used a lot. Domestic hot water is used a lot all the time um, during day hours and evening hours. Main shutoff is identified, 100 amps. One finger is 100, two fingers is 200, and so on. Um, that's not allowed <laughs> yet to tie uh, two 20 amp breakers um, together with a piece of copper uh, wire. Uh, don't remove the dead front cover, it's hazardous. But uh, if you do, you can take a look at, uh, I like to look for debris inside, maybe some paint spray on new homes. Um, don't want the doorbell uh, inside the electrical panel. Um, don't want the, the um, don't want anything inside the electrical panel really. You want it nice and clean. Uh, you don't want water. You don't want mice. You don't want uh, double taps. You don't want overfusing where you have a big fat breaker on a small wire. Um, and we can go on about um, the grounding wires and the neutral wires under the same uh, fastener lug. But yeah, that's what I picked out. So I find those defects and I put in a report regardless of the age of the home. Those are bad uh, unfocused pictures. So take your time in getting a, a good picture. A picture's worth a thousand words, except pictures like that. You can't even tell what's going on. Um, there's the grounding wire. There's the bonding wire. Um, I'm on. So electrical panel is probably 15 minutes. So now I'm thinking like, oh man, this is like approaching. I started at eight o'clock, 8.30, 8.45. I'm down at the heating system. Remember the garage. And then like, you know, I'm thinking, uh, mm, I'm at 9.30 right? I'm trying to get to the rest of the house. Um, I'm at 9.30 right now. So the, remember the exterior doors? Yep. They open and close. No big deal. Structure. The concrete foundation wall was painted white. Whenever I see fresh white paint, <laughs> I start to smile because I know that they're hiding something. Uh, and they were. They didn't even finish painting here. Um, so you can get to see the, the paint. Uh, that's my... Um, those are my tools. So um, the left side of the foundation wall, obviously, they should have painted it. But uh, you can see that there's actually water streaks and mud streaks coming through at the bottom uh, row of concrete blocks. A lot of that's awesome. Um, a lot of those problems with water intrusion start on the outside. And remember, we didn't have any gutters on the top roof. So there's and the bottom gutter was filled with debris. So uh, every rainstorm just hundreds of gallons of water would dump right next to the foundation. So, um, and painting it isn't going to fix it. So, uh, they need to fix the water intrusion starting from the outside and then work your way in. Painting doesn't do anything. doesn't fool a home inspector either. Um, those tools there, that's a extendable moisture meter. Um, they don't make them anymore. So all I know is that they have moisture meters like this in the hand and the red thing, um, they still make them. I just bought this. This is incredible. It's a gardening tool, and it's a, an extendable 
handle, gardening tool, with three tines, one, two, three tines. I heat up and straighten the, uh, the one tine. Um, the other one you can straighten a little bit and keep the other one hooked. And with those combinations, you can um, poke things, you can um, pull on things, you can move things, you can move insulation, you can hook things and move uh, insulation, then put it back, you know? So it's, it's really nice to have that reach. So, and then you put it away in your toolbox, your tool bag. Oh, this is, a, this is my tool bag. You still make them with the pockets on the outside, pockets on the inside, nice shoulder strap. And this is the right dimension for me because I can stick just about anything in there. And I uh, Velcro strap on the outside, that, or you can put it in like that. And uh, yeah, that's a good size for. So this is an Internachi uh, branded tool bag, if you're interested, if you want a nice blue Internachi tool bag. Not sure how much it is. It's worth it, though, if you don't have one. Got to keep your tools with you. Where are we? Ah, uh, water coming in, painting. There's no laundry top. They removed the laundry top. I don't know why. Hmm. Uh, the, um, there's no access to the crawl space, not easy access, and the ductwork is not sealed or insulated. So we're, we're um, going into an unfinished, unventilated at, uh, crawl space. Ideally, all the ductwork would be sealed and insulated. I take a picture of the floor joists, looking for that. Um, signs of prior water leaks from the kitchen above. There's no insulation, so it gets kind of cold. This is an older home. Don't expect to see insulation. There's water marks all the way from the corner to the center of the of the house, of uh, basement floor, and there's water marks streaking on top of the freshly painted foundation wall. So I know that the water came after the house, the wall was painted. That's not a good thing. Mold. Water. Some pump, a lot of mud around it, and it's um, not functioning. I lift the float, doesn't work. And the discharge pipe goes into the laundry. Well, it's not really a laundry. It's not, I don't think it's connected to the septic system. I think this pipe is separate from where everything else goes. I think this goes down into a creek somewhere, right? I've seen that before. And there's, if this was connected to the sewer drainage system, right? Um, there's regulations and standards, like the standpipe isn't tall enough. This is an illustration from Internachi's gallery of illustrations to help you communicate the defects that you observe. Can't get into the crawl space. Uh, crawl space access should be 18 by 24 minimum. Can't do it, can't get in there. However, I can stick my camera in there and take some pictures. Um, and there's a, a ton of debris and there's no ground cover. So we have an unvented attic, uh, crawl space with insulation installed, but it's collapsed and falling apart and exposed dirt. So a lot of um, problems with ventilation, indoor air quality and insulation, energy efficiency issues um, are in this crawl space. We have some really good training and articles about inspecting crawl spaces. That ductwork is not insulated. Um, and if you want to learn about indoor air quality issues, how to inspect a crawl space, how to correct a vented crawl space. Crawl spaces, ideally the building science studies now and recommendations, we're all moving towards treating a crawl space like a um, basement, a short basement. No exposed dirt, insulation, and no ventilation, but conditioned air. So that's ideal. Where, where you want to go. You want to think of a crawl space as a short basement room, right? However the basement room is, that's how the crawl space should be. That's the general idea, building science principle. A lot of things like a disconnect that's not connected to anything. I'm just going to put that in a report. A lot of things like laundry tubs not missing, uh, lo not installed, missing valves. There's a lot of plumbing issues. A plumber is needed.
All laundry receptacles should be GFCI protected. There's a bunch of thermostats controlling zones in the ductwork. Half of them worked. Um, maybe two out of three didn't. Um, water stains from above, moisture meter, a lot of water leaks. Um, wood in contact with the concrete um, and the lower treads should not be in touch with the concrete unless protected, pressure treated would be good. Um, then there's water marks and mud. So, and then other things like let um, electric devices and lights hanging from the, the duct work. I'm done. So that's 10 o'clock now. I started uh, a little bit before eight, got there early, eight o'clock. 8.30, 8.45, I'm going into the house because uh, I just finished the roof and the exterior and I'm in the house and I do HVAC garage and the water supply coming in, drain going out, hot water tank, electrical structure. Now it's, that was nine o'clock. That's uh, We're approaching 10 o'clock and I'm getting a little nervous because I need to finish this up at about an hour. But when I'm here, I'm thinking after I do the attic, I'm basically done. So I'm, I'm kind of happy. The access panel is not insulated or sealed, so the conditioned air up there is just moving through this knee wall. And the knee wall is not insulated or installed well and has this weird paneling. And the ductwork is not sealed or insulated. And there's a lot of inspection restrictions. I'm not sure what the duct tape on the paneling is for. Um, can't see what's going on above the second floor ceilings. Um, but I take a picture of him. And just a lot of missing insulation and loose insulation and wiring defects. That's a hazard there and missing insulation. And there's that's um, vermiculite insulation. And to understand a lot about the environmental concerns, indoor air quality, things about healthy homes, vermiculite is a health hazard. It's a hazardous material. If it's disturbed, disturbed and it gets in your system, that's not a good thing. EPA is an excellent resource. Hope it stays around and funded. Um, we need the EPA for information like this uh, about this type of uh, hazardous material. Don't disturb it. EPA simply says, uh, handle it like lead paint. Um, leave it in place if it's in fair condition and encapsulate it, which is covered up so it doesn't get touched again. Um, we can take a look at the underside of the roof sheathing. You can look at the nailing and the fastening, make sure it goes through and you can actually tell a lot about the, the roof covering materials by looking at the tips of the fasteners that come through, um, and their length and size and the amount of fasteners. If you have a lot of fasteners, you may have two layers of roofing shingles. Low, so a lot of defects here, a lot of defects and the thermostat is broken. And there's a lack of supply and return registers. Flush the toilet, not working. Not working at the sink. Not working outlet. And it's not GFCI protected, even if it was live. And the shower is not working. Thermostat, this one actually did turn on. That one did not. Um, missing valve, leaking valves. I think hard water was doing that. There's the supply register for the entire um, bedroom upstairs and the second floor opens and closes. Oh, there's the second one. But it's, um, th so there is a heat source for every room upstairs, but um, I doubt that it was actually designed well. I think this is an afterthought, but I'm gonna put it in the report as a concern. Smoke detectors, there's regulations on them. Uh, missing ground. Uh, connection at the three prong receptacles, even though there's three prongs, there's a missing ground. I think there's old wiring in the house. Some receptacles are dead. Some receptacles are two prong and I can't even test it. Right? So I want my clients to know now I'm in the kitchen. So I know I'm in the kitchen in about once I get past the attic, I've got the interior, which is representative number of windows and doors and receptacles and finished materials and the ceilings and the floors and the steps and handrails, if there are any. And then I'm getting down to the kitchen because that's where I end. When I'm at the kitchen, I know I'm done, right? I have probably five, 10 more minutes of work. So if I'm at 10.30, I'm doing really well. 
because at 11 o'clock, I love to be in my truck. I've got my lunch. I brought a second shirt and I've got my directions and my file for the next job. And I'm going to drive and eat at the same time because I don't sit under a tree and have lunch. I've got work to do and I want to get to that second job so I can be home before four o'clock or five o'clock. I leave at 7.30. I want to be home at four, 4.30, five o'clock, something like that, right? It's reasonable. I got a family. I don't want to be gone too long. I don't want to write the inspection report at night either. So as I inspect, I'm writing the report with my mobile device. It's a quality of life issue, right? And I'm making money because I'm not spending a whole lot of time. I'm making a lot of money in relation to the number of hours that I work. Um, oh, no, no water running at the kitchen sink. Uh, this is a defect. I don't need to, to see it leak. It's a defect, right? <laughs> uh, some agents will say, or some people, I don't want to pick on agents. Some people will say, well, if it's not leaking, it's not a problem, right? So, but that's a problem. Um, so is that. Uh, disconnected water. So we have problems. And the stairs from the second floor attic, I forgot. I ran upstairs to do something to check the the bathroom fixtures upstairs to see if they were connected or at the plumbing because it's kind of like the kitchen sink and there's no handrail at the stairs. That's a defect. That's my bag. See my bag, my tool bag and the things hanging out. I do the first floor receptacles, smoke detectors, windows, doors, floors, bathroom, running water. The shower doesn't turn on well, missing ground fault, broken tile, Tub works, shower doesn't, open up the tub panel, access panel. The water is turned off. So in that closet of the first floor bathroom are the shutoff valves for the second floor. Home inspectors are not required to turn on valves. If they want running water upstairs, someone else has to turn on those valves. Because as soon as I turn on that valve and turn on the water supply to the second floor, something nasty is going to happen. And I'm going to be responsible. And it'd be a lot of fun. It'd be really funny if I can't turn off the water, right? I turned it on and I can't turn it off. I don't know why. Those are nice ball valves. But things happen. These are off. If somebody wants it on, same thing with electricity. If a breaker's off, I'm not turning it on, right? It's a visual-only inspection. It's like moving through the house with both hands behind your back. I don't, I don't move anything. I don't lift carpet. I don't move anything. It's just a visual inspection, right? If I have a tool, I'll use my hand for a tool, you know, flashlight. Yeah. Plumbing problems. Um, I don't like um, dissimilar materials uh, connect mechanically f uh, fastened with uh, a, a non approved mechanical fastener. And that, um, is a improper fitting. Um, same there. Um, so, oh, got the shower to turn on, sink, flushing the toilet. Great. Just moving through the interior, missing element at the electric stove. Electric stove and oven are very old. Um, missing GFCI protection at the kitchen counter receptacles and the cracked tile on the floor. A lot of damage. And that's the end of the inspection. And I print the report. You don't have to, right? But I do. I bind it in a three ring binder. I give it to my client. I get paid and I'm out, right? And they're my neighbors. So I tell them, you're my client. You're my neighbor. I'll be having a barbecue party um, every summer for my clients, recent clients. I invite them over. A lot of them don't make it, but it's the act. Um, it's the invite. It's the thought that counts, right? So you invite all of your clients to your house because you're all living in the same neighborhood and you want to stay in contact with your past clients because it's like a gold mine for a business. So some businesses have 500 past clients that they never talk to. Those past clients are talking about you and your business. What are they saying? You don't know because you don't talk to them. It's like a gold mine. So if you could just get your past 100 clients to refer one job to you. Did you get that? 
past 100 clients in the past year to refer one job to you, you've doubled your business, right? If you're doing 100 inspections a year and you get a referral from every one of those, just one, boop, you've doubled your business. Second here, you've quadrupled it. So you're contacting your past clients is essential. Don't let them go. Keep in contact with them. Email them. Provide them with a home maintenance book. Provide them with something they can put on their bookshelf. Right? Send them marketing materials that InterNACHI's marketing team can customize for you and you send it out. Little postcards, little invites, little reminders. Okay. Uh, let's see. Any questions? Yes, keep going. We're going to keep going. Can you point us in a direction of emissions? Yep. Um, someone wants to know where to get insurance. We talked about that already, but I'll put it up again. Insurance. Boop. Um, uh, gypsum board is drywall, although SOP states you have to remove the dead front cover. Shouldn't we still learn how to do this safely, provide thorough inspection? Right. That's really up to you on whether you should exceed the standards of practice where you want to, right? So it's really your call. You're not required to remove the dead front cover according to the standards of practice. So you can't be worried about that. Someone's Someone can criticize you, but you can always refer to the standards that says you're not required to do that. Um, IR camera works excellent in DB boards to ID hot connections. I don't know what that means, but I, I love I, I infrared cameras, uh, Stan. Yes, looking for scorching in the panel. Yes, Daniel, looking for scorching. Uh, yes, it always helps to insulate. Yep, all right. So that's it, folks. Did you have fun? That was the class. Uh, thank you for coming to class. Thank you for asking so many questions. You guys are awesome. Go to Natchi TV for the next class. If you'd like to join us for the live class, I'll be here with another 250 students probably. Um, you can join the discussion or just register so that you can get a link to the video recording and watch it later. Um, and if you want to contact me uh, or anyone on staff, um, they all work for you essentially. You know, there's, there's 30 people, full-time staff, working at InterNACHI, and they're essentially just providing services for our members all day long. So feel free to contact us. We're all on the contact page. All of our pictures are there too. So go to natchi.org forward slash contact. All right, I hope you had a lot of fun. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time in class. My name is Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. See you in class. Bye, everybody.